as it appears in the final line, be replaced with the words lease providers. Yes. So that the final sentence of that paragraph reads, while we see this in payday lending, small consumer credit contracts and consumer lease providers, we do not see it regularly in other areas. Yes, that's right. Uh, do you have a pen that allows you to initial that amendment there, Mr Boyle? I do. <coughs> It's page 19, yes, you have that there? Thank you, Mr Boyle. With that amendment, are the contents of your statement true and correct? They are. I tender that statement. Exhibit 4.138, the statement of Mr Boyle. Now, uh, could you please describe, uh, firstly, Mr Boyle, your cultural background? Yes, I'm a Wiradjuri man. Uh, my family's from central western New South Wales, but I grew up on Biripai country uh, my whole life, and I now live on Gadigal country in Sydney. Thank you. And could you tell us about your professional background, Mr Boyle? Yes, uh, I have completed a law degree, but I want to make it quite clear that I am um, not a lawyer. I've been working in Indigenous policy issues uh, professionally since 2006, and in financial services uh, issues for Indigenous people specifically since around 2009, and I've been in my current role at ASIC since 2011. Now, Mr Boyle, have you been involved in advisory groups in the course of your work? Yes, I have. Uh, could you tell us about your work for those advisory groups? Yes, as part of my professional role at ASIC, I sit on the National Indigenous Consumer Strategy um, Reference Group, which implements and, and uh, designs the National Indigenous Consumer Strategy. I have also sat on the Indigenous Advisory Group of the National Indigenous Financial Services Network uh, from approximately 2011 until 2015. I sit on the uh, advisory group for the North Queensland Indigenous Consumer Issues Task Force and outside of uh, my role at, at ASIC, I also sit on the Indigenous advisory group of the Indigenous Financial Resilience uh, Research that's been conducted by uh, the Centre for Social Impact and First Nations Foundation and I'm on the Indigenous advisory group of the Financial Rights Legal Centre. And are you also, Mr Boyle, on the editorial panel of the Indigenous Law Bulletin? Yes, I am. Thank you. Now, could you please give us a brief overview of the work of ASIC's Indigenous Outreach Program? Yes, ASIC's Indigenous Outreach Program is a team of lawyers and analysts uh, with specialist skills uh, working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. We've had a formal program at ASIC uh, called the Indigenous Outreach Program since about 2009 and our team performs um, a range of functions. The first is to provide financial capability education to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander consumers. And um, we do that predominantly through uh, resources that are placed on the Money Smart website, as well as through face-to-face -face, um, interactions and a range of other innovative types of financial capability devices that we design to try and assist Indigenous people um, to understand financial services. Our second role is working with the financial services industry to try and um, show them where policies and procedures that they have uh, might not be um, adequately servicing <coughs> Indigenous financial consumers and to really take them out and, and show them um, how their policies work on the ground to try and increase financial inclusion of Indigenous people. Um, and then we also take reports of misconduct from Indigenous consumers and their advocates uh, about their interactions with financial services and we will assist ASIC's other teams to uh, conduct investigations and enforcement activities in a culturally appropriate way and assist ASIC to, um, to engage with Indigenous witnesses on the ground to, uh, so that they can provide their evidence comfortably. How does ASIC decide where to conduct its Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander outreach work? Um, as with all agencies, I think we do have limited resources and we'd, we'd love to do our outreach work everywhere. Uh, but we try and pick areas where we think we're going to have the greatest impact. So where we think um, that a particular community uh, <laughs> has a serious issue accessing a particular financial service, uh, we might engage with that community and take industry leaders there to show them um, what the issues are. 
We'll also uh, get requests to travel to communities about particular issues from consumer advocates or Indigenous consumers themselves. Or from time to time, we'll be asked by other government agencies to uh, conduct outreach for particular purposes. And an example of that is the fee-free ATM initiative where um, our team provided some education to, to communities that didn't have other, other money management workers in them. Uh, can you explain what ASIC's Indigenous helpline is? Yes, ASIC runs um, both a telephone and email helpline, and that uh, provides direct access to myself and other members of my team. So um, consumer advocates and Indigenous consumers uh, can contact that helpline any time that they uh, have an issue that they think um, we might be able to assist with. Uh, but as part of the National Indigenous Consumer Strategy, we also have a no-wrong-door uh, no policy. So any Indigenous consumer or their advocate can, can ring us about any problem and we'll try and direct them to the appropriate service if it's not us. And how many calls do you tend to receive on that line each year? Each year um, we would receive in excess of 500 calls, I, I would estimate. And could you just finally tell us a little bit more about your specific role within the Indigenous Outreach Program? Yes, I'm, I'm a senior policy analyst and I've been in the team um, since 2011, as I said before. Um, the team <coughs> has only been around since 2009, so really shortly after ASIC uh, started a, a particular focus on assisting Indigenous consumers, I've been involved in the team. Um, I'm involved in all aspects of the work of the team, so I help to produce or advise on financial capability materials, assist in taking evidence and, and preparing witnesses for court and also in uh, leading, uh, leading industry tours, I guess, for want of a better term, to Indigenous communities to, to try and highlight the barriers. Thank you, Mr Boyle. I'll come back to ask you some further questions, but could I turn to you now, Mrs Edwards? Uh, your name is Linda Edwards? Yes, that's correct. And you are the Coordinator Financial Capability at Financial Counselling Australia? Yes. Uh, and Financial Counselling Australia's head office is at 179 Queen Street in Melbourne? Correct. Uh, now, uh, uh, Mrs Edwards, have you been issued with a summons to attend the hearing today? I have. Do you have that summons with you? I do. I tender that summons. Exhibit 4.139, the summons to Mrs Edwards. And Mrs Edwards, have you made a statement to the Commission dated the 22nd of June 2018? I have. And is there an amendment that you wish to make to paragraph 57 of yes. your statement? And is that amendment uh, to the fourth line in that paragraph? Yes. And is the amendment to amend the word changed to read charged? Correct. Uh, so that that sentence now reads, this was because Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were charged each time they checked their account balance or withdrew cash. Correct. Uh, have you made that amendment to the statement, Mrs yes. Edwards? Have you initialled that? No. Thank you. If you could initial that. And with that amendment, are the contents of your statement true and correct? Yes. I tender the statement, Commissioner. Exhibit 4.140 is the statement of Mrs Edwards. Mrs Edwards, could I ask you too to please describe your cultural background? Yes, um, I'm a Wonkamara woman um, from New South Wales, central New South Wales, uh, sorry, far west New South Wales. Um, uh, I live now on um, Wiradjuri country in central New South Wales. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity now to know that, to let you know that I am off country and I would like to acknowledge the Larrakea Nation and pay my respects to the people of the Larrakea Nation. Um, yes, yeah, so, and um, so Narromine is about approximately 430 um, kilometres from Sydney. Thank you. That's where you reside? Yes, it is. Yes. Uh, now, could you also tell us about your professional background, Mrs Edwards? Uh, so I, I had 11 years working with local government um, as a finance officer and 13 years working with uh, Catholic Care in Wilcannia Forbes in central New South Wales. Um, I was employed as a program manager. Um, and work predominantly with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in a um, financial counselling um, uh, capability role. Uh, I am an, a, an accredited financial counsellor with um, Financial Counselling New South Wales um, and am currently studying the Diploma of Financial Counselling. Thank you. 
And are there government or community sector bodies in which you have participated over the years? Um, yes, I have been a uh, representative on a number of um, government and community <coughs> sector bodies. Um, these include the um, Commonwealth Consumer Affairs Advisory Council, which is um, an advisory body to federal government. Um, the Indigenous Financial um, Services Network that's working with the banking industry. Um, and um, I have also assisted Financial Counselling Australia on a voluntary basis um, to coordinate the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Forum, um, which is an annual one day um, event for financial counsellors and capability workers. Um, I also sit on the Indigenous Resilience um, Research Project with First Nations Foundation and the Centre for Social Impact. Uh, I am a member of the Telstra Indigenous Advisory Body and I partner with First Nations Foundation on shared practices and program and activities that are specifically designed by and for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Thank you, Mrs Edwards. And could you please give the Commission a brief overview of the work that Financial Counselling Australia does? Yes. So financial Counselling Australia is the peak body for financial counsellors in Australia. Um, financial counsellors um, provide um, advice and support to people that are in financial hardship. Um, they work predominantly in community organisations <coughs> and their services are free. Um, they um, give advice, uh, independent, confidential advice and funding for financial counselling services are mainly provided by federal and state government. Um, if Financial Counselling Australia was formed in 1984 um, and it is a federated body, um, there are seven members um, of Financial Counselling which are the state and territories. Um, individual financial counsellors are then members of the, their um, respective state, um, state and territory associations. Um, financial Counselor Australia's role is to coordinate and support financial counsellors um, in their profession and to advocate for a fair, fairer marketplace. Um, this includes sharing information, providing professional development um, and training, um, developing resources for financial counsellors, um, writing submissions in response to policy um, proposals and participating in relevant um, consultation groups um, around um, Indigenous financial literacy. And Mrs Edwards, what's the difference between a financial counsellor and a financial capability worker? Um, financial Counselling Australia's current um, contract with the federal government is to support financial capability workers. Um, financial capability workers are the ones that uh, uh, participate and uh, run um, education, educational workshops around financial literacy um, to people on the ground. Um, at the moment there are approximately 70 financial capability workers across Australia um, and approximately um, 40 of those work predominantly in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Um, yes. And how many financial counsellors work with Financial Counselling Australia? Um, there's approximately 780 financial counsellors um, across Australia <coughs> um, and 10% of those work predominantly with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and communities. Um, and there are just over 50 financial counsellors that identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. Thank you, Mrs Edwards. Now, uh, could I move to asking both of you uh, some questions? Uh, can I start, uh, Mrs Edwards, with you by asking you about the obstacles that are faced by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who live in regional and remote communities when engaging with financial services entities? Yes, there are a number of barri barriers that, um, uh, that are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in remote um, and regional communities um, come into contact and that's certainly one of those is about access. So many communities are long distances from branches um, and uh, you know an example of that is um, the community of uh, Mitajulu at the base of Uluru um, is 470 kilometres from the nearest branch. Um, and so people, many people living in remote communities find it very difficult to access um, any, um, bank, any bank branches um, due to um, obviously long distances but also to the environment. So uh, many people have to uh, travel across uh, you know, dirt roads so uh, when the rains come you know, roads are cut for months at a time. Um, language and literacy are a major problem uh, for um, regional and remote, particularly remote communities, where English is, you know, can sometimes be um, 
you know, second, third, or even a fourth um, language. Um, so understanding, you know, what banking products are and particularly uh, the products where it's written is, is always really difficult for, um, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, there's very um, limited understanding of banking products. Um, so and there's, um, you know, there's not that understanding of what actually is an interest rate and what does it actually mean. Um, and certainly the total, you know, cost of a loan um, is, is something that, um, you know, um, that a lot of um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in those communities do not understand. Um, we have culture and kinship uh, within our communities um, and the understanding that um, uh, one person can be responsible for another um, and the environment that they live in. Um, so having um, kinship, uh, which is a type of cultural obligation, um, will actually play a role in people's um, um, uh, financial affairs. Um, and um, unfortunately, uh, most of the financial services don't understand cultural obligation uh, when it comes to hardship policies. Um, the other uh, barriers uh, that uh, that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, is that there is a trust, so um, it's really inappropriate to disagree or um, not talk to someone. Um, and we found that with door-to-door -door sales, um, where uh, you know there's not that um, opportunity for people to say go away. They will sit and they will stand and listen um, to the person, and obviously then sign a contract. Um, we have re really low incomes uh, within <coughs> Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander regional and remote communities. Um, we know that the majority of people in those communities are on Centrelink benefits um, and trying to um, purchase food in remote communities can be really difficult as well. So the cost of groceries within um, those uh, regional and remote communities could be twice or three times the amount that people would pay in urban centres. Now, Mr Boyle, on my count, um, Mrs Edwards has raised seven different obstacles there. Can I take you to each of those and ask you if you'd like to comment on any of them? Um, the first was access to financial services, uh, particularly um, geographical access to financial services. Would you like to comment on that? Yes, but first I would just like to say that there, uh, and kind of commenting on your opening statement yesterday, that there is as much diversity amongst Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in terms of financial knowledge and capability as there is in the broader population. And in the work that, uh, that my team does at ASIC, we tend to come across people who have much lower levels of financial literacy and are at the edge and being excluded financially. But certainly the comments that I make today, I don't want them to be taken as applying to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people living in uh, remote areas. So th the first was the geographical isolation. Yes. And Yes, we, we see a lot of barriers that come from geographical isolation. Uh, people being significant distances from bank branches does mean that it's difficult for them to get a face-to-face -face service. And uh, that is compounded by identification issues for Indigenous people, and, and I know we'll talk about that as, a, as another issue. Um, but if an Indigenous person in a remote community wants to access a financial service, and they don't have appropriate identification documentation. And at the moment, often, they're being asked to travel to the nearest bank branch. And as Ms Edward said, or as Linda said, um, that can be 480, 500 kilometres away. Um, and that request is often made for people if they lose a key card, for example, and they contact their bank branch and they're unable to pass the, the authentication process <coughs> over the telephone, then they're asked to go to their local bank branch. So that geographical isolation really does um, present a major barrier. Also, in a lot of uh, particularly remote and very remote Indigenous communities, uh, information and communication technology is only relatively recently um, implemented into the communities. And as an example, I was in the Anunupitinjata Yankunajata lands in um, northwest South Australia four weeks ago, and uh, mobile telephone networks were only turned on in that community six weeks ago. So there are still communities in Australia that don't have um, reliable internet or telephone coverage and that makes it very difficult for people to contact their bank branches as well. Now, the second uh, set of obstacles that Mrs Edwards referred to, I understood to relate to both language and literacy. Do you wish to comment on those? Yes, there, there is um, a small but significant proportion of Indigenous people that still don't um, have uh, very good English literacy skills. So 
there are people who struggle to read or understand um, financial concepts, and there are people that, that do struggle to communicate over the telephone with financial service providers. So that is a, a significant issue. Educational levels in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, particularly regional and remote areas, tend to be uh, much lower than for the general population. And that means that, that they are un unable to comprehend and to understand the complex language that's used in many financial agreements or by financial service providers. Uh, now, uh, Mrs Edwards also referred to a lack of understanding of how financial uh, products work. Would you like to comment on that? Yes, absolutely. I, I would um, second what Linda said in regards to that. that uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have a relatively recent, uh, particularly in, in rural, uh, regional and remote areas, have a, a relatively recent experience at working with financial services. So for a lot of people, they were subject to income management policies and and haven't had access or the ability to make their own decisions about finances. So there is a real lack of understanding about the way that financial products do work. Um, and Linda gave the example of people not understanding interest rates, and we certainly come across that. Uh, in one of the matters that ASIC ran, uh, people were being charged 48% interest under a contract. And as part of our um, investigation of the misconduct, uh, we asked people what their understanding of that interest rate was. Was 48% good or was that a bad interest rate? A lot of people told us that it was very good and people told us that the higher the interest rate was, the better it was. So people, um, I think out of about 20 people that we spoke to, only two people could tell us that interest was actually money that you paid on top or extra. For, uh, so. If people can't understand interest rates, then that means that they have um, real difficulties understanding a whole range of other um, financial products and services. Uh, another example would be overdrafts um, or informal overdrafts on, on banking accounts where people have a debit card and go to an ATM. For a lot of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, if money comes out of their bank account, they think that they did have money in their bank account. So we see a lot of people um, being charged quite significant fees where they've um, had a direct debit dishonour or where their account's gone into overdraft and they, they really weren't aware that overdrafts existed or that there were fees attached to that. Mrs Edwards also referred to Aboriginal culture and kinship structures. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about that? I can and I don't uh, propose to be an expert on anyone's kinship structures other than uh, my own family and my own communities. But uh, we do have relatively complex kinship structures and so uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people don't view our family as being a nuclear family um, as Western communities tend to. We'll have obligations to a range of other people in our communities um, and in uh, broader, not even necessarily blood relations that are also seen by us as being um, the most appropriate person or the closest family contact for financial services issues. And we see that playing um, a particular, particularly disadvantageous um, role in the administration of deceased estates around superannuation, uh, because under the, under the trust documents and the way that superannuation estates are, are passed out, uh, it does tend to have a focus on the nuclear family. And for a lot of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, that will not be the appropriate person to receive the estate. So we do see families that will, uh, will have a deceased estate and there will be conversations made, but because the appropriate person to receive the benefit under that estate uh, is not a family member that, that is allowed to receive that payment, we see people um, not even make an application. Uh, now, I, I want to come back to you to talk about the other factors that uh, Mrs Edwards raised, but while we're talking about culture and kinship structures, can I ask you, Mrs Edwards, <coughs> in your work, um, what, what does it mean to have the sorts of obligations, <clears throat> excuse me, that both of you have discussed in a practical sense in an Aboriginal community? Um, a typical example is for funerals, um, when people are attending funerals. So what would normally happen is um, families would travel um, to the community where the funeral is being, being held um, and the hosting family that where they would stay would be responsible for feeding the family. So that could possibly mean that there are 20 more people that live in the home, that stay in the home for the length of time. And in some remote communities, the grieving process, because all of the community grieve together, could be weeks, 
um, rather than just days in a traditional Western um, society. So, you know, the electricity goes up because there's extra people in the house. Um, one of the things is that, you know, because family members need to be there, it's culturally appropriate for family members to be there, that sometimes they can't get there. So then that sharing of resources, um, ensuring that, you know, petrol is paid for people to be able to drive to and from the, the funeral is one of those examples. Thank you. Just touching on what Linda said yeah. around funeral arrangements as well, that is another area where our kinship structures do play a significant role. So um, funeral insurance products, for example, uh, they often have particular beneficiaries who can make the claims, whereas in <coughs> remote Aboriginal communities in particular, um, there can be a certain member of the community that's responsible for making, for making arrangements for funerals, and they're not necessarily the people who have the ability to make claims under funeral insurance policies. So we do see that sometimes having having a, a negative effect as well. Now, returning to the obstacles identified by Mrs Edwards, another obstacle that Mrs Edwards identified um, related to the trust that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, can place in others. Uh, you refer in your statement to the concept of gratuitous concurrence. Are you able to explain what that means? Yes, gratuitous concurrence is a tendency for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to agree to a proposition that's put to them or, or to make affirmative noises um, in, in response to a proposition that's put to them regardless of whether or not they agree with that proposition. So that's the first way that gratuitous concurrence um, plays out. And the second way is, is where an Indigenous person will answer yes uh, to, to a question that they don't understand rather than want to appear silly. And so there is a tendency among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people not to want to appear rude to a financial service provider, for example, and, and they will agree yes, yes, um, even without understanding what they're being asked. The final matters that Mrs Edwards referred to related to low income and the high cost of living in remote communities. Would you like to comment on either of those matters? I'll, I'll comment briefly, um, which is that, um, and, and again, we, we see unemployment and the types of employment programs that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, particularly in remote areas, have um, playing out in the superannuation sector again. So a lot of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in remote communities are part of um, employment programs run by the government, like the Community Development Employment Program, for example, which requires people to undertake work-like activities for up to 25 hours a week. And we see um, a lot of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that don't see the difference between them kind of government employment programs and paid employment. So that creates difficulties for people in, in understanding whether or not their family members might have had superannuation or whether the, they themselves will have superannuation. Just with that gratuitous concurrence um, aspect, I'd like to go back to that just briefly because I think it's quite a difficult concept to understand. Um, but um, in a recent outcome that we had uh, with Clearview Life Assurance Limited, we listened to a range of, um, of call recordings um, as part of investigating some, some misconduct that was reported to us. And what we heard in some of those um, calls was people who were being walked through the process of signing up to a funeral or life insurance policy. And they were saying yes or mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and in a couple of the calls, we seen consumers that said, the, the telephone representative would ask them, can you provide us with your bank details? And they say, oh, we don't, I don't want to pay anything. Oh, no, you won't have to pay anything now. Just provide us with your bank details. Yes, OK. And they provided the details and ended up being signed up to policies that they never intended to sign up for. So that's the way that gratuitous concurrence can, can play out in practice, that people will provide details that they're asked for by someone that they see in a position of authority over the telephone, including bank details and other personal information, um, to the point they've provided enough information to have entered into a contract, even though they never intended to. Now, is there anything else that either of you would like to say generally about obstacles encountered by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in remote communities in their dealings with financial services entities? Mm, no, not at this time, no. The only other real barrier for people um, that I see, I'm sure that there are others that I've missed, is in enforcing their rights in financial services. So um, the way that we enforce our rights in Australia is through, through the court systems and we have a, an adversarial type system where um, people are represented and 
Often when we're investigating financial services misconduct or, or allegations of poor behaviour in Indigenous communities, people want to present their evidence as one story and it is quite difficult for them to then enforce their rights um, in a court in the way that, that we usually would in Australia. Now, uh, I want to move on to uh, particular products and the way Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people engage with those products. But before I do that, could I return to something that you said earlier, Mr Boyle, which was about difficulties experienced by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in meeting the identity uh, requirements in dealing with banks in particular. Could you tell us some more about that? Yes, so Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, have been subject to a lot of government policies historically, uh, including policies that around the removal of children. So uh, a lot of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in regional and remote communities don't register births, deaths or marriages. And that means that they don't have a birth certificate, for example. Um, and without a birth certificate, it can be quite difficult to access other types of identification documentation, such as a driver's licence um, or, or Centrelink. The, the other issue with identification is that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, again, particularly in remote and regional areas, uh, tend to have a range of names. They might have their traditional skin name, they might have a birth name, they might have an adoptive name, and it's not uncommon to see people having identification documents in all three of, of those names. And um, I can give you one brief example uh, to highlight, illustrate that issue, uh, which was I was in Lockhart River, I think it was back in 2013, doing some work on superannuation, and uh, a gentleman came to me and he was 72 years of age, and I believe at the time the life expectancy there was 58 years for men. He had superannuation and he said to me, when will this money come to me? We told him that he'd reached his condition of release and that there was financial counsellors there to provide some assistance. When we asked for his identification documents, um, we asked, did he have a birth certificate? And he said, yes. The government had, came, uh, had come to the community and helped people to access birth certificates a couple of years ago. And his name was Normi, N-O-R-M-I-E. So his birth certificate was in that name and obviously with his surname as well. But often when government departments issue birth certificates after someone's been born or a significant period of time later, they'll register the birth as either the 1st of January or the 1st of July in the year that the person believes that they were born. And that was the case for Normie. In a lot of remote communities, uh, people don't have access to the, the range of services that we do in, in cities or in, or in um, urban centres. So to get a driver's licence in a remote community, often you go to the police station. And that was the case with Normie. He'd gone to the police station and he remembered his real date of birth, for example, was 23rd of March. He told the police officer that and been handed his driver's licence. And the driver's licence said that his first name was Norman. He said to the police officer, that's not my name, my name's Normie. And the police officer told him, no, 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 Normie's not a real name, your name's Norman. So he had two formal identification documents that both had different names and different dates of birth. And we see that play out in, in a whole, uh, often. So you mentioned the superannuation context there. Uh, the superannuation context and the bank context are the two contexts in which those difficulties arise, is that right? That's where we see it most often, yes. Yes, yes. and in the banking context, um, how do identification issues emerge? Identification issues emerge really at two key points in the banking system. So the first is at establishing a bank account. If you don't have adequate identification documentation, it can be almost impossible to even open a, a standard bank account, which means that a proportion of um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are completely financially excluded and don't have access to even uh, basic financial products. The second place that we see identification um, play a role, and I think I mentioned it briefly earlier, was where someone might lose a debit card, for example, or lose a banking product and need to, to have a new card issued and they'll contact their bank via the telephone. And it can be quite difficult for people to identify themselves or to answer the questions that are asked over the telephone. Um, sometimes we see financial services have policies about the types of questions that are asked and they can only ask questions in a certain way which might not make sense to an Aboriginal person in a remote community. So for example, um, one that we come across quite regularly is where we'll contact, we'll, we'll be assisting someone to contact a financial services entity and they'll be asked, what is your street address? And in a lot of remote communities, there aren't street names. And the person will say, oh, I don't have a street address. 
or they'll be asked three or four times what the street address is, whereas if they were asked what number is on the front of your house, then they can answer that question. But sometimes the language um, means that people aren't able to, to meet the identification requirements. And as I said earlier, that often results, and it has in the past resulted, we've had specific examples of it, of people failing that identification process and then being told to travel to their nearest bank branch. And I, Lockhart River is a community I'll come back to again in, in that circumstance. So um, the closest bank branch to Lockhart River is in Cairns. And I had a call a couple of years ago from a lady who had lost her bank card, had um, failed the identification processes and was then told to travel to Cairns to visit her local bank branch. And it was during the wet season. So the only way that she could get to Cairns was to, was to fly from Lockhart River, which was quite expensive. And she was quite distressed when she contacted us. Uh, Mrs Edwards, would you like to comment on identification issues for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in their dealings with banks or with superannuation funds? Yeah, so for, for financial counsellors, we, we realise that verifying identification for many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, is, is, is really um, challenging. Um, you know, sometimes um, we know that documents are actually not kept by the person. It's usually sometimes kept by either the mother or matriarch or the grandmother within the families. Um, and uh, um, many um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in remote communities can be transient, so they may not even be in a place where their birth certificate is. Um, in 2016, Austrac released. Um, I'm sorry, if you could just repeat that, Mr. Sorry, Edwards. in 2016, um, Austrac um, released new guidance about the requirements for identification for um, for uh, financial entities, <coughs> um, and that's where um, you know uh, those entities, um, it, instead of getting birth certificates, could actually um, get people to identify by going to a community, um, a local Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander community uh, service, or a local elder. Um, unfortunately, um, those processes are not always kept um, uh, and, and used by, by um, financial entities. Um, and we know that um, for financial counsellors in particular, um, the time to assist people in proving their identities can be a real challenge and takes a long time. What um, proportion of financial counsellors' time uh, in dealing with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander clients do you think is made up of dealing with identification <coughs> problems, assisting with identification problems? I would say probably for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, um, more time than, than is actually um, required. Um, and it seems that every financial counsellor that is actually working with, um, well, most financial counsellors that are working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander are saying that um, majority of a day would be taken trying to f help a person um, prove their identity. Mr Boyle, uh, what have you observed about the uh, uptake of the uh, Austrac guidance about alternative ways of uh, satisfying identification requirements? Yeah, so that Austrac guidance that, that allows people to provide alternative documentation when they can't meet the standard 100 points of identification has been um, acknowledged and taken up by financial services institutions at the kind of head office level. Yeah. But what we've seen is that often um, the existence of that alternative guidance or alternative ways for Indigenous people to identify themselves to financial service providers hasn't filtered down to the customer facing staff or to the telephone staff. So whilst the guidance is there and, and we see commitment to um, implementing the alternative guidance by the financial services industry, we're still not seeing um, a real reduction in the difficulties that people are having identifying themselves on the ground. It often takes um, people to elevate that to, to someone like myself at ASIC in order to, for that to be highlighted to a financial institution that, that there are there alternative policies in existence. So yeah, and we receive regular reports from people who, who are aware of the guidance, consumer advocates who will contact our assistance line and will say, look, I've still been having difficulties with, with my clients and they're still being told to go to local bank branches or, or they're not being assisted um, to get into that additional process. So I think that the policies are there and, and they're known by the institutions and the institutions have a commitment to applying them, but that not, hasn't necessarily reached the customer facing staff, which means the, the difficulties still exist. 
And Any observations about that, Mrs. Yeah, Edwards? and that certainly has been reported by financial counsellors, where um, you know they are actually talking to um, financial services staff at the coalface, where they're saying, "Well, you know, have you seen the um, Austrac guidance?" And they and uh, they would say, "What is that?" Um, so then taking them through that process, and then them realising that there are other alternatives to identification. What do you observe about the um, numbers of um, employees of financial services entities who are Indigenous people? Um, just uh, personally myself. Um, so I have actually uh, met um, and I, I actually know um, some um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that have actually worked in, in the banking industry um, that have left because um, they were pressured to um, sell products to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that they knew themselves um, were not appropriate. Do you think it would be valuable for Indigenous people to be employed by financial services entities to assist in engagement with Indigenous people? You know, I think, um, you know, um, uh, most um, financial services and particularly the banks um, with reconciliation action plans, as long as they're ones that are actually going to be, you know, that they're, um, you know, competent in, in, um, in working within that document and are listening to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff that, you know, say what their challenges are, you know, I think that, you know, it's it, it would be, um, you know, very beneficial to have Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people within branches. Uh, because I know myself, if I go into a branch and I see an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person there, that's the person that I want to know that I would like to deal with. Mr Boyle, do you have any views about that? I certainly think that more employment of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the financial services industry would assist institutions to understand the issues and would certainly make it easier for Indigenous people, particularly those in regional and remote areas, to access them services. Um, just having a voice that understands uh, a person's needs or the difficulties that they're facing um, can make them feel much more comfortable and it can also make people <coughs> Are more open and less likely to fall into practices like gratuitous concurrence. If they're dealing with another Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person, they can form a bit of a relationship and often feel more comfortable asking questions mm -hmm. um, and asserting their rights. So certainly I would support m more employment of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the financial services sector. Uh, can I turn now to asking you some questions about the particular financial products uh, that are used by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in these communities and their understanding of those products? Can I start with you, Mr Boyle, and could I ask you to explain <clears throat> how Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in remote and regional communities use debit cards? Yes, certainly. Um, I mentioned briefly earlier that uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people use debit cards, um, but I, I guess to explain debit cards, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people might have a debit card or a credit card or, or cards with overdrafts, and often we find that people in remote and regional areas don't understand the differences between the various types of cards. So that's the first thing. Um, but uh, ATM fees have been a significant issue in particularly remote Indigenous communities. And there was a, a, an ATM task force uh, quite a number of years ago that um, wanted to investigate the impact that ATM fees were having on remote Indigenous people's finances because consumer advocates had been reporting that a significant proportion of people's income was being taken by ATM fees. And uh, ASIC was part of that task force with the Reserve Bank and Treasury, as I understand it. But what um, people observed was that the ATM fees that were being charged in those communities they were comparative to urban areas, so they, they weren't a great deal higher. But what the issue was and why people were spending so much on ATM fees was that real lack of understanding about how debit cards work. And so the behaviour that was observed was that someone would go and put their card into an ATM machine in the morning and find out that they didn't have any money in there yet and they would be charged a fee. They might do that two or three times and then the money would be in their account. They would withdraw, say, $20 from their account and then they would put their card in again to check what the remaining balance was. So people were sometimes paying five or six bank fees um, in order just to withdraw $20. And again, the withdrawal of small amounts of money um, by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in remote areas is often a way for them to manage their money. So they'll withdraw a small amount of cash, what they need for that day, 
um, and that way that they are able to budget that over the fortnight. But that means that making them regular small withdrawals is costing them a fee each time. Um, can I ask you a question about another concept that you refer to in your statement that I think might be relevant to the answer you've just given, and that's the concept of humbug. Could you explain what humbug is? Yes, yeah, so um, demand sharing, for want of a better term, is something that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures have had for many thousands of years in that we have obligations, reciprocal obligations, to care for each other and to provide um, support, both emotional and in terms of kind of material objects or food. Um, that's extended now into the financial services space um, where often there is an obligation to assist other family members with money, but where repeated demands are made for money and it becomes almost a bit of a hassle. Um, the particular family members are often requesting money, um, sometimes from more vulnerable people, then that's coined humbug, where someone is being repeatedly um, requested to provide money for family members and it sometimes leaves them um, with not enough money for themselves. And so that is, I, that's why I said sometimes that people do withdraw them smaller amounts of money. So they know that if they've only got $20 with them, then that is probably all they'll be humbugged for that day. Mm. Uh, and are debit cards shared um, by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in these communities? Yes, often a debit card will be shared and um, other people will have access to both the debit card and the PIN number. Um, that's both just as a result of general demand sharing obligations, but also as a result of other services, informal credit services, for example, in Indigenous communities, um, book up, for example, where some providers will um, require Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to leave their debit card and their PIN number and details of their income at a store to access that service. So the person might be without access to their own banking products for some time, and then they'll utilise other family members' products to do that. Um, I just wanted to make one more comment about the debit cards as well, which is while some people withdraw quite small amounts of money, $20 at a time, sometimes people do need to withdraw larger amounts of money and on ATMs that are located in very remote communities, often there are withdrawal limits of say $200, which means that in order to access $1,000, you need to pay five bank fees because you need to withdraw five lots of, of $200. Mrs Edwards, a number of themes have come up in Mr Boyle's answer about the use and understanding of debit cards in these communities. Can I ask you to comment on those themes, including humbugging? Yep, certainly. So we know that in um, through the financial councillors that um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, in their communities are sharing debit cards and pins. And there are other reasons of that is um, if it's uh, an elderly person, they don't, don't always remember their pin. Um, so it's usually the, the younger people that would actually hold that card or family member. Um, you know, that, um, that then sort of leaves people open to, um, you know, economic abuse. Um, but in, in most cases, um, you know, people, um, uh, uh, yeah, do share and, uh, and do that because of cultural obligation. Um, so when we're thinking about, um, you know, um, kinship and cultural obligations, we, we need to think that, you know, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, sharing and, um, and looking after each other and looking after the environment has been for 40, over 40,000 years. Money's only really been in our, in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander society for just on three generations. So it's a really early, it's a really um, early experience for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And for people in remote communities, it's probably even less than that. Um, and so it is really challenging. So, you know, if you're responsible for someone, you know, emotionally, socially, you're also responsible for them economically too. So um, it's, it's really difficult to, um, to be able to say to a family member, you know, I can't help you. Because um, I know that with um, majority, majority of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, that's really playing with our spirit, and you know it's not in the spirit of giving. So um, certainly, um, it is a, a, a real challenge for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, so in regards to um, the debit cards, we know, um, and uh, Financial Counselling Australia was one of those services that went on the road in regards to that task force for ATMs. Um, 
and we are seeing, um, you know, and we have seen at that time um, the multiple use of debit cards when accessing um, the ATMs, and you know, and that's because the the payments that sent that Centrelink would give, so um, it, it doesn't actually mean that it's going to be there at seven o'clock in the morning. It could be at any time during the day. It could be in the afternoon. So people are continually checking to see if their payments are there, and sometimes we can see fees for a day of being twelve dollars fifty, you know, anything up to. Um, $16 for people to, to be able to just check to see if their payments are in there and not really understanding that every time they put their card in that there's a fee um, around that. So, mm. Particularly where people have um, a lack of English language skills, if people are unable to read in English then often the warning that comes up on an ATM um, doesn't mean anything to them and, mm. and they don't realise they're being charged a fee. So. Um, one of the things that ASIC did was a number of years ago we partnered with the Territory Insurance Office to produce talking ATM posters in a range of Indigenous languages so that when people go to use the ATM, it talks to them in their language and says, by the way, you'll be charged a fee and here's some, here's some tricks to, to avoid being charged multiple fees. So that's a real issue that people, um, people making their multiple transactions aren't making them with the knowledge that they are being charged a fee each time. <coughs> Uh, now, you both referred to the work of the task force that led to the ATM fee-free initiative. Uh, Mr Boyle, can you explain what that initiative involves? Yes, so the, the fee-free ATM, ATM initiative uh, was uh, helped, helped to be put together by the Australian Bankers Association and a range of um, financial service providers, banks and, and credit unions have joined into the fee-free ATM initiative and basically uh, in a range of very remote Indigenous communities as, as defined by the Australian Bureau of Statistics, um, a range of financial service providers have come together and made an agreement to make those ATM fees um, free for people, ATM transactions free. Uh, in very remote Indigenous communities, usually an ATM is, uh, is privately owned as opposed to being owned by a branded institution, which means that they will charge fees. So, uh, the way that it works is that at, at the moment they're uh, under the first authorisation, um, which uh, has recently been extended. Under the fourth, first authorisation, there was 84 ATMs in very remote Indigenous communities um, that met the criteria of being a part of the fee-free initiative. There's a range of criteria that an ATM must meet to to um, to be able to participate in that program. So it must be in a very remote Indigenous community. It must not be located at a venue that sells alcohol or other gambling products and a range of other factors. Um, the latest authorisation doesn't provide a limit on the maximum amount of ATMs that can be part of that fee-free ATM initiative, but as I understand it, there still is around 84. Around 84 ATMs? Yes. And are you able to say how many communities those 84 ATMs serve? Andrew and I were having a discussion yeah, about this just this I morning. I could probably answer that. So at the moment there's 82 ATMs that are, have been approved um, uh, by the ACCC and in, in that there are approximately 70 communities that are participating in that. So some of those communities have multiple ATMs. Um, one of the things that would be beneficial for people in those communities is that if there's a sign on there saying that this is a free AT, a free fee-free ATM would be really helpful. So they, if they go to one, they know that if that sign's not there, then they should go to another to be able to use it. And in, in your view, Mrs Edwards, uh, has this been an effective initiative? We have seen that there has been a considerable savings for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people by using these ATMs, yes. Do you have any observations about the effectiveness of the initiative, Mr Boyle? It's significantly reduced the detriment that's being caused by ATM fees in uh, the communities where there are fee-free ATMs. However, uh, the rollout of the program hasn't always been effective. So when we were providing education in a range of those communities uh, back, I believe, in 2013, in a number of the communities we visited, there wasn't any cash in the in the fee-free ATM, so people were still needing to use um, ATMs that were charging them uh, with fees. And I had a recent report, I think it was three weeks ago, from the Commonwealth Bank, who, and they have a, a, a job title called a customer advocate that travels out to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities to find out about their experience with the bank. And the Commonwealth Bank rang me to say that their customer advocate had recently been on Palm Island where there is a fee-free ATM and that the customer advocate had noticed that Commonwealth Bank customers were still being charged ATM fees by the ATM deployer. 
And so as I understand the Commonwealth Bank is currently trying to think about how to refund those fees um, to those customers. But so where the fee-free ATMs are working and they regularly have cash and they are not charging fees, then it has um, significantly reduced the impact of those fees, but it's not a perfect system. And because of the criteria that have been set up for the program, uh, there are other communities that certainly could benefit from having a fee-free ATM, um, in particular where there is no other branded ATM that they could use so that they could always have, uh, have fee-free transactions. Mrs Edwards, have you observed communities that would benefit from these fee-free ATMs but don't meet the criteria for the fee-free ATMs? Yes, we have. So uh, uh, what was uh, required um, at the beginning of the discussion was um, for people to um, um, nominate a community. Um, and I know that in within my own community, I come from um, Wilcannia in far west New South Wales, I nominated my community. Um, but unfortunately, the only ATM in the community was at the local club. So it wasn't um, eligible for, um, for a free ATM. And Wilcannia sits um, 200 k's from Broken Hill one side and about 260 k's from Cobar the other side. And it's actually listed as one of the most 10 disadvantaged communities in Australia. And that community is not eligible for a no, free, free ATM? No. Uh, Mr Boyle, do you wish to say anything more about that? The only other thing that I would say is that, uh, as a re and not commenting necessarily on the criteria, but as a result of that, sometimes the fee-free ATM in the community is in an area that people don't visit very regularly. So there are some communities that have a fee-free ATM, but we still see the majority of transactions happening at an ATM that charges fees. Um, that again is as often as a result of people not realising that one ATM is fee free or not understanding they're being charged a fee either, but also that the, the ATM that community members prefer to go to because it, it is at the local shop or it's at the, the place where they drive into a community isn't part of that trial as a result of the criteria. Is it common in your experience, Mrs Edwards, for debit cards to be lost by people in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities? Yeah, one of the challenges for um, people in remote communities that we've seen as financial counsellors is um, not being able to keep documentation very well. So, uh, you know, there's not a lot of um, people that actually have a wallet to be able to put their cards in or their birth certificate. So it's always been a real challenge um, that, um, you know, that <coughs> these cards are lost. Um, and then the process of actually trying to approve identification and getting another um, card, debit card for um, clients um, has taken a lot of time for financial counsellors. Uh, now, uh, finally, in relation to uh, debit cards and transaction accounts, can I ask you, Mr Boyle, about informal overdrafts that can be attached to these accounts? Uh, in your experience, do Aboriginal people understand when they have an informal overdraft attached to these accounts? No, people tend not to understand um, that what an informal overdraft is if they use their ATM card to withdraw money and the money comes out, then people tend to think that they did have money in their account, which is where people are getting caught out with sometimes um, being charged overdrawn fees or, or interest rates on the overdrawn amount um, when they just simply weren't even aware that that was a possibility for them to be charged. And is that something that you see as well, Mrs Edwards? Yes, definitely, yes. Uh, can I turn to credit cards, uh, Mrs Edwards? Uh, are credit cards commonly used by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in remote and regional communities? Um, in the experience of um, financial counsellors with the clients that they are seeing, there are not many people that have credit cards, um, and that's simply because people do not understand what a credit card is. Um, for those people that may have it, which are very, there are very few, um, particularly um, that are seeing financial counsellors, um, they see um, credit cards as free cash, um, not as something that they actually have to pay back. And they certainly don't understand the interest rate um, of a card and how long it would actually take to pay back um, to be able to yeah, pay back to the credit card um, uh, you know, over many, many years if they're just paying a minimum, the minimum amount for that credit card. Could I ask that we bring up on the screen a document that you've provided us, Mrs Edwards, which is RCD 9999053000101. This is a colour version of a document that you've annexed to your statement, Mrs Edwards, which is a photograph. <coughs> now, is this a photograph of uh, visual tools that Financial Counselling Australia uses uh, 
to demonstrate the differences between a debit card and a credit card. So um, Financial Counselling Australia doesn't actually use this, this um, resource. So this, this resource was made by a financial counsellor and a capability worker Thank you. Uh, here in the Northern Territory. Um, and they realised that, um, you know, for many of their clients, um, visual is the way that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people learn um, the most. Um, and because writing, in, um, you know, having writing, um, particularly for people that have English as a second, third, or even fourth <coughs> language, um, th there was just uh, no, um, there was no uh, possibility for people to actually understand what uh, debit and credit cards were doing. So, um, this visual, um, and I am, uh, and I'll quote the workers. So, the workers that actually sent me this uh, photo. Um, so. Um, our people are very visual, we respond to the language of art through paintings on canvas or in the sand. The use of visual versus literacy is used to start the conversations with client that we see being um, English as a, uh, being fifth or sixth on the list of languages that can be communicated. Art is a universal language. So the painting on the right um, is the debit system um, versus credit system, so yours and theirs, banks. Um, the drawings provoke and encourage the discussion and demonstrates that when a client uses a debit card and non-revolving credit facilities, they are in a happy place within themselves. Um, the lower section depicts the negative emotions felt by creating debt by having contracts and credit cards in a general owing in a general way of owing money, um, and the painting on the left um, uh, depicts how banks and debt collectors are connected, um, and why the client gets letters demanding payment. For example, car loans and phone accounts. The drawings demonstrate that conversation between the banks and the credit reporting agencies being negative or positive. Um, this was initiated due to clients getting letters demanding payments from go cards and have little or no understanding of what happens after they get the goods and then getting statements from credit providers. So basic cards and credit cards um, on the uh, uh, indistinguishable from each other because both are green. So green is the card for basic card and green is also for the go card. So this story then actually begins the conversation for the financial counsellor or the capability worker to have a conversation around financial literacy. Thank you, Mrs Edwards. Could I attend to that colour depiction of the annexure to uh, Mrs Edwards' statement, Commissioner? call it uh, banking visual aids. It's described in the statement as visual tool used by financial capability workers in Alice Springs. <coughs> visual tool used by financial capability workers, RCD, treble, uh, Double nine double nine zero five three treble zero one exhibit four point one four one. Mr. Boyle, could I ask you to comment on uh, the use and understanding of credit cards by people in these communities? Yes, I would, I would agree with Linda that uh, credit cards we see less people having credit cards than, than debit cards, and we do hear of less issues with credit cards in very remote Indigenous communities. Uh, certainly, there are pockets of of there are certain communities. Um, where we see a larger number of people that have, that have got a credit card. And when people do have a credit card, um, they usually don't understand um, how it works in detail or how the interest rate works. And one example that I can think of um, was, again, a, a lady in quite a remote community. She had a credit card of $2,000 and she thought that that was her $2,000 bank account. And so she would pay her entire income onto that card each fortnight but she didn't realise why she had less and less money to spend on food um, each fortnight until we'd visited the community and explained it to her. So we see it. Um, uh, we see less people being impacted by credit cards uh, in remote communities, but where people do have a credit card, we see uh, people not understanding them and sometimes being called out by that misunderstanding of how the product works. Mrs Edwards, could I ask you to explain uh, the concept of a basic bank account? Yes, so through the um, Australian Banking Association, um, banks are required to have a concession account for people that are on Centrelink benefits um, and um, also on... Um, uh, yeah, so that uh, where there's no fees attached to that, to that account. Um, 
and you know this is actually um, will be um, assisting people um, financially by not having fees and charges um, debited from their account for the amount of time that you know that they're using their debit cards um, and you know this is really important um, when it, we think about how many times people go and check um, you know if their if their incomes in the uh, in the bank or if they're <coughs> withdrawing small amounts of cash which they use as a budgeting tool so, um, so major all of banks, uh, most yes, all of banks um, are required to have concession accounts. Uh, now, uh, are you familiar, Mrs. Edwards, with the draft revised banking code of practice that is currently with ASIC for approval? A little bit, I am. Yes. yes. Could, could I show you RCD? Nine 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 zero zero three seven zero five zero two. You see there the obligations that are proposed in the new banking code of practice in relation to basic accounts, which involve raising awareness of those accounts. Yes. Giving information that is easily accessible about those accounts. Yes. Offering those accounts if someone asks for one and they are determined to be eligible for one. Yes. And training staff to help them to recognise a customer or potential customer that may qualify for one of those accounts. Yes. Now, can I ask you about uh, your observations of the extent to which banks are currently complying with these sorts of obligations? Um, what we've found um, through the financial counsellors is, is that um, the, certainly the banks are, uh, are not, not very proactive um, in um, promoting these, uh, this product um, and certainly um, people that are going in and opening accounts, there are no, there's no conversation around um, you know, their income or possible income so that there's no opportunities for people then to even know about basic um, uh, concession uh, accounts. Um, We've had conversations um, with the bank around, you know, identification for people, um, particularly Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that are coming in. Um, the banks are really concerned that they don't want to ask people to identify because they, they, you know, they, they think they're going to be seen as um, as racist um, um, or or not actually um, acting in the best interest um, of the client. Um, but what I can say is that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have been asking to identify um, over a very long period of time and certainly through a lot of other services like uh, health, um, schools, universities. Um, and that's because it was around trying to be as um, as much as supportive as possible to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander to close the gap, but also to offer um, services that would be really appropriate. Um, so, um, yeah, but certainly um, on at the coalface, uh, very few um, people are being told about basic bank accounts. And in your experience, are banks asking Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander customers um, to identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders? No, they're not simply because of the reasons that I've just said, um, that, that they don't want to seem to be um, not acting in the best interest of the client. And I, I take it from the answer you've given that you would regard it as valuable for that practice to change. Certainly. I mean, we've had lots of conversations with banks where they said, we, do, we are doing the best for our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander customers. And, and it's always been the thought was, OK, so you must ask them to, to identify. And they go, no, well, how do you know that you're, you're working in the best interest of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? Um, Mr Boyle, could I ask you to comment on those topics? There's a few things in there about identification um, uh, by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in their dealings with financial services entities, but also about your experiences uh, with the promotion of uh, basic bank accounts. Mm. So the identification issue, I'll begin with that because um, it would be a, a great thing, I think, if um, banks and other institutions were able to identify which customers that they had that were Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander particularly um, where people lived in remote or regional areas, really assist the bank to be able to direct people to them appropriate policies like um, the ident alternative identification arrangements. And uh, I've had some discussions with 
other people in the financial services industry recently and one executive was talking to an executive at a different institution and that other institution said, oh no, we don't have any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander clients. But they actually have no way of knowing whether they do or they don't and it's um, very likely that that institution does have Indigenous clients and could benefit from um, some further thought about how to best service those clients. So I would support the fact that um, having an identification of people being Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander would certainly benefit and in particular it would allow institutions to know that they do have Indigenous um, clients. The basic bank accounts, uh, on the ground in practice we do come across a lot of low income earners that are on uh, accounts that charge fees when they might otherwise be eligible for a basic bank account. As I understand it the banks um, do have a commitment to uh, provide basic and low fee accounts to low income earners. Uh, but most often that is happening if, if an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person themselves identifies themselves to the bank as being someone that is eligible for one of them accounts and um, it doesn't seem to have been proactive across the board to try and provide low income earners with them fee free accounts. Yeah. Can I just say that um, you know, what, um, one of the things that would be really beneficial for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and also for the banks as well is to be proactive in that space. So, um, you know, when people's um, uh, when their income goes into the bank, it's always identified. So you will see on a bank statement, um, you know, the, the, the payments come from Centrelink and it's for New Start, or it comes from families and it's, you know, obviously um, family <coughs> tax benefit, um, that the banks would be proactive about that and say, hey, this person's actually on a, a low income and on a Centrelink payment, but they've actually got an account that pays fees. We need to contact this person and say, there's a better product for them. That would be really beneficial. Why is it important for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who live in these communities, Mr Boyle, I'll ask you this, to have access to fee-free accounts? A lot of people in very remote Indigenous communities are on substantially low incomes. And so even a small fee of, say, 10 or $20 is quite a significant proportion of people's income if they are in uh, sole receipt of, of welfare support payments. Um, or that they are in employment that pays them periodically or at very low amounts. So having them fee-free accounts means that people will have access to the entire proportion of the funds that are placed into their bank account, whereas when people are being charged them fees, sometimes a fee of $20 is 10% of a person's income for the fortnight. Commissioner, could I tender that draft revised code of banking practice? It may be in evidence from other hearings, but I think it would be useful to have it in evidence for this block of hearings too. Exhibit 4.142, <coughs> Proposed Code of Banking Practice, RCD 9999 Now, Mrs Edwards, uh, sticking with the topic of fees, can I ask you, um, in your experience, how significant a problem are overdrawn fees for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in remote communities? Um, well, if you think about um, someone that's on a Centrelink benefit that may have um, overdrawn fees, uh, which could be $6 at a time, um, that's just continuing every day until it actually picks up that, uh, that, that payment. Um, you know, it's, it could possibly be, uh, you know, as Nathan said, 20% of their income. Um, and sort of not understanding that, you know, that uh, uh, you, know, you not need to not go in and draw too much money out, particularly if there's a direct debit, um, is is just another another reason of um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people not actually understanding banking products. Uh, Mr Boyle, would you like to comment on overdrawn fees and their imp impact on people in these communities? Yes, uh, we've had reports of very significant over overdraft fees, where often um, people's entire income or a significant proportion of that income when it goes into their bank account will be used to pay off that overdraft facility. Um, some of the overdraft facilities don't have monetary limits, so it can be a person's entire payment that goes to that overdraft, which means that the person becomes trapped in, a, in an overdraft cycle, for want of a better term, where they are continuously paying overdraft fees and always receiving less and less of their income. Yeah. So, um, you know, at the moment there is a code of operation that sets out, um, you know, how a service provider can actually um, recoup that money. Um, and at the moment, you know, not, they can only access 10% um, of a person's income. Um, and, um, you know, 
we're, we're simply saying that you know at least 90% people should be able to um, be able to keep that amount of their income support payments. So people can negotiate with the banks to take a little bit more, um, but you know um, obviously there's a co code of operation for a particular reason for people that are on low income, um, and unfortunately um, you know for uh, it, this has actually been removed in the. Um, so it's not actually included in the in the 2018 code of banking practice. Now, could I just ask you on that point, uh, Mrs. Edwards, to look at a page within the document we just tended, which is RCD quadruple nine zero zero three seven zero five two three. So back to the um, revised proposed banking code of practice. And could I just ask you to look at clause 181 of that document? Yes. So in the, in the new code, uh, are we right in thinking that there will be an obligation to comply with the code of operation? Um, there could possibly, but what we're finding is the code of operation is not being used by banks yes. in a systemic way. Yes, so the obligation will be there, yes. but your experience is that there are difficulties with complying with that obligation. Yes. Is that right? That's correct. Mr Boyle, would you like to comment on that? I don't have direct experience with the bank issues. I have heard anecdotally that um, some people that are on uh, welfare payments as, as the main source of their income when they do have overdraft facilities, for example, that sometimes more than 10% of their income is being taken to pay that off when the code of operation would um, provide an obligation for a financial service provider to make sure that they were leaving uh, the consumer with 90% of that income in order to pay for their essential essential goods. Yes. In terms of direct experience, I don't have a great deal. And uh, can I ask you, Mr Boyle, uh, how significant a problem uh, you think dishonour fees are uh, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in these communities, dishonour fees can um, be quite a, can have quite a significant impact on people in these communities. Um, so dishonour fees, for example, where a direct debit has been set up to take money, a, a recurrent bill, for example, out of someone's account, um, <coughs> because of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's lower level of understanding about how finances operate generally. People sometimes won't know which day the money does go into their account or they won't understand the way that direct debits work. So what we see, um, not uncommonly, is that people might have a direct debit set up to come out of their account on the day before their income comes in. So they are repeatedly uh, having to pay them dishonour fees. Um, I've had some very positive experiences with the financial services sector about identifying and, and, um, and resolving them situations so I can think of one example where I was contacted by someone at the Commonwealth Bank um, who had noticed a significant number of, of dishonour fees were being charged in a particular area and the bank had done some research and identified that it was a, a postcode that had a significant Indigenous population and that bank contacted ASIC's Indigenous Outreach Program to ask us could we work with the bank and with the business that was um, regularly having them direct debits come out at inappropriate times to make sure that they uh, did set up the direct debits with the customers on a day that there would likely be money in their account. And um, so I wonder regarding direct debits whether if someone is either identified as being on a low income or on a welfare support payment whether there couldn't be an obligation on a financial service provider um, to assist that customer to set up a direct debit at a time when it's more likely that there would be money in their account because that would definitely reduce the impact of them fees and can be quite significant. Um, so you've referred there to failed direct debit payments. In your experience, are they a common cause of dishonour fees for people in these communities? Yes, very common. And do you agree with that, Mrs yes, Edwards? I do. Yes, yes. Uh, can I ask both of you, starting with Just you, before Mrs... Before we leave that, are there other causes of uh, uh, dishonour fees other than failed direct debits? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, no, not that I'm aware of either. I would have thought Maybe. they would all be DDs, direct debits. But I, I believe so, mm. because yeah, that would be the only time a dishonour fee was charged if there wasn't money in a bank account. Uh, direct debit fact. 
Uh, can I ask you, Mrs Edwards, whether you think that banks could be doing more to ensure that appropriate fee structures are in place for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in remote and regional communities? Um, yes, um, I think that um, you know there is uh, opportunities um, for for banks to work with financial counsellors, um, uh, and I know that banks do refer customers to financial counsellors um, around um, you know uh, their accounts and and um, how uh, they're using their accounts. Um, probably being more proactive, um, particularly around the basic. Um, accounts, um, you know, we know that um, there are no fees and charges. Um, I wonder, though, if those bank um, basic bank accounts um, do attract the dishonour fee. Um, and you know, if that if that is the case, then banks should be working proactively with the with the customer to actually find out what's actually happening. Um, Nathan mentioned that some of those direct debits could be could be coming in prior. Um, to people um, getting their income, um, but we have seen too that it, it actually does come after the income um, because people know that the direct debits are going to be there and they <coughs> tend to not leave money in there. So one of the things that the banks could be doing is working with people to say, you know, you have this account, um, you know, maybe set up a bills account where that direct debit would come out so that the money's always in there, as an example. Mr. Do uh, Mr. Boyle, do you have any comments about how banks could uh, improve their uh, fee structures to assist Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people <coughs> in these communities? I think that it would be, in terms of fee structures, uh, where there are fees being charged on accounts, it would be great if the financial services sector could uh, provide more information to people about the fee structures and about the fees that can be charged in a language that they can understand or in a way that they can understand because um, regardless of what the fee structure is or how low the fees uh, might be, um, most accounts do have some type of fee attached to them. Even no fee accounts might have a direct debit dishonour fee, for example. <coughs> and I think, yeah, the, the biggest thing that could be done would be assisting people to understand the fees that are being charged and making sure that people are aware um, of fees that may be charged on their account. For example, if there is an informal overdraft, specifically, um, explaining what an overdraft facility is to a customer and making sure that they're aware of how much they will be charged or um, potentially on a basic bank account uh, not having any informal overdraft facility at all. And I'd like to add there that, um, you know, given that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are very visual, um, that, you know, some of those resources around bank fees could actually be resources that are visual and, and very easily explained rather than having big words around what a, you know, a fee structure is. If you spoke to an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person and you said, um, you know, what's the fee structure in, in your bank, they would probably not even understand what that actually means. So having resources that are really in, in plain, in very plain and very visual would be would be helpful. Do, do either of you see any problem uh, in saying uh, no informal overdrafts on a basic account? Is that going to lead to a, uh, a problem of which I need about which I need to think? Do you think? Um, I think that people are, uh, it's really people's choices, but if I had to take a hard line and think about basic bank accounts, I would probably say no to overdrafts on no basic ideas. bank accounts. And I, I would agree with Linda that um, we, we don't take choice away from people, but in terms of basic bank accounts, there are a particular bank account and you can choose to have one if you're in a low income. If you wanted to access an informal overdraft facility, you could certainly move from your basic bank account <laughs> into a fee charging one. So I, I can't see any issue in, in um, banning overdraft facilities outright on basic or low fee bank accounts. And if you wanted a formal overdraft, you'd have to apply and the bank would have to meet the responsible lending obligations, wouldn't they? As I understand it, yes. Correct, yeah. yes. Commissioner, that might be a convenient time for a brief break if... Sure. Yes. When do you want me to come back, Ms Orr? Oh, uh, half past would be fine. Or 25 oh, two. Sorry, I'm a bit slower. Yes, 25 two would be great. <coughs> All right.
Yes, Ms. Orr. It's falling down. I've asked both of you questions about some credit <coughs> products, about credit cards, but can I ask you some questions about some other consumer lending products? <coughs> uh, you, you may have heard in the opening statement my reference to car loans uh, and uh, the importance of car loans within these communities. Is that something that either of you are able to comment on, the importance of the car and therefore the importance of finance to acquire a car in these communities? I can start. Yeah, I can, I can probably start with that. Um, no, given the remote, remoteness of um, many communities, a car is really important um, to people in that community. Um, and we know that Aboriginal and um, Torres Strait Islander will, will usually commonly, commonly access a car yard to, um, to purchase a car. Um, and what, what we found is that car dealerships um, will often take advantage of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, by uh, giving them um, car loans with high interest rates, um, will give them, um, you know, cars that are actually not uh, uh, lemons um, and certainly will sell them, you know, insurance that it really is not worth the paper that it's written on. Um, we know that um, through the financial counsellors that um, some car dealers will actually drive into communities with trucks with cars on them to sell them when they know that um, royalty payments are coming into the community um, and usually these cars then um, break down within uh, a couple of weeks um, and obviously being in a remote community where do you go to get your car fixed um, and so the cars um, never never get fixed. Um, we. In, in regards to the financial counsellors, many of these um, loan contracts are really irresponsible lending um, and that um, that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are given these loans that is far in excess of um, of what their income is. Um, so it, there's, you know, where there's no savings history, there's, um, uh, they have um, very little opportunities to, um, to pay off the debt um, and then are left obviously with high debts. Mr Boyle, do you observe difficulties with car financing in these communities? Yes, and cars are almost an essential item for some people, particularly when they're at a significant distance from services like hospitals or, or other places. Um, so people really do rely on having access to a motor vehicle. Because people are on lower incomes and in very remote communities, geographically isolated from mainstream lenders, um, that means that often people are trying to finance their car in other ways and one way that it's common for people in very remote communities to finance cars is through um, informal credit provision like book up, which is often at the moment uh, not captured by the National Consumer Credit Protection Act. So we do see people um, being given quite significant loans on um, varying terms that aren't uh, subject to the responsible lending requirements of our legislation. You've mentioned book up a couple of times this morning and I mentioned it yesterday in the opening statement as well. Could you explain exactly what book up is? Yes, yeah, so book up is like an informal store account and in its simplest terms, if I can't afford bread and milk, I go to the shop, they write down bread and milk and the cost and then I come and pay that off uh, when I've got cash available in my bank account. But um, in uh, some disadvantageous book up operations, we're seeing terms such as uh, requiring consumers to leave their debit card and their personal identification number with the store um, and then we're seeing people remove all or nearly all of consumers income from their account each fortnight to reduce that debt and because BookUp in, a, in and of itself isn't captured at the moment necessarily as a financial product unless it meets certain requirements or it's captured as a financial product but not as a credit facility um, subject to regulation by the legislation. Uh, to be subject to regulation by the Credit Act, you must have a fee or a charge for providing the service and the credit must be provided for a period of more than 62 days. And so what we do see is um, commonly where people are entering book up arrangements and they uh, don't want to be subject to the regulation of the Credit Act, that they are just keeping records in such a format that, that we can't possibly prove that fees are being charged or, or that the debt's being deferred for a period of time. And you refer in your statement to work that ASIC is doing with the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet uh, in relation to potential forms of regulation for book up. Could you explain what that work is? Yes, at the moment consumer advocates have been raising book up issues with us for a long time and we've been consulting widely with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people around an appropriate way to regulate that service. 
And so we are trying to um, bring a range of best practice requirements into the provision of BookUp, including record keeping requirements. Um, so if there are record keeping requirements, it'll be much easier for ASIC to take action where communities are identifying unconscionable conduct with us. And uh, we're at a stage where that consultation will begin uh, probably in the second half of this year. Is book up a practice that you'd like to make any observations about, Mrs Edwards? Yes, yeah, so um, we have seen uh, financial councils have reported um, uh, book up and we know that um, within some communities uh, the practice of book up is actually keeping people in a, in a cycle of financial <coughs> hardship um, because normally what would happen is that they would uh, book up until they get they, they get their payday um, and that when they actually have to pay the account um, at the store because then they won't let them use the store until they pay their account, it's majority of their um, their benefits would actually go on book up. And so then for the next fortnight, they, then they have to depend on book up again. So it is certainly a predatory practice um, and certainly um, a, a lot of... Uh, uh, consumers in that space um, are not even given the uh, opportunity to see any transaction records of what they may have purchased. Um, I know I can't certainly remember what I purchased two weeks ago. Um, you know, certainly people um, are not actually being given that opportunity and um, as far as that we're aware of. I did want to say about book up though that um ASIC's view is that it is uh, often, if it, if it operates according to best practice principles, yeah. that it is a very good service that can assist people to manage their income between paydays. And I myself grew up using uh, using book up accounts, and if we didn't have access to book up, then we would have gone without things like bread and milk. So um, ASIC's view is that where it does operate according to best practice principles, that it can be a very good service for Indigenous communities to make sure they have access to food and other essential items between paydays. But it's where... Um, where that behaviour is not, not operating according to best practice principles and uh, sometimes is deliberately uh, falling outside of regulation by us that we do see um, really unscrupulous behaviour. Uh, and Paul. the financial counsellors are actually seeing that as well, that um, you know, in those cases it is beneficial. Um, it's where the predatory um, behaviour comes in, that it's where people are put at a disadvantage. So, Mr Boyle, uh, you referred to unscrupulous behaviour and, Mrs Edwards, you've referred to predatory behaviour. Are there other consumer lending products that you see that form of behaviour in connection with in these communities? Yeah, so um, we know that it's not under the terms of reference um, for this uh, for, for this commission, but um, uh, payday lending and consumer leases are, have a, a huge um, negative impact on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander to people. Um, uh, we know that you know um, that people are, are pay, uh, <coughs> often get a payday loan um, um, for a very short period of time, so it's up to 16 days and one year. Um, and uh, we have seen um, that um, these loans, the the interest rate on those loans are really, really high. Um, consumer leases are the same. Consumer leases are where people go and get white goods such as furniture, um, you know, uh, fridges. Um, and we've seen that the uh, the contract price of those goods compared to the retail price um, and the, the value of the goods, uh, are, are, are the gap is quite considerable where, uh, you know, we have seen um, cases where a person has got a washing machine, for example, um, and it could be, uh, the value of the good could be $600, but through a consumer lease, um, they could be paying $2,000 for that particular <coughs> washing machine. Um, and we've we've known that um, in some cases, some the annual annual interest on some of those consumer leases could be anything up to 884 um, percent. And both of, both of those practices are very predatory. They're very unfair, um, and it really does um, inc does show irresponsible lending. Um, and we see where some of these um, contracts actually when. The, um, are still being charged for goods even after the lease has expired. So certainly it's, it has been a, a, it's one of those uh, products, these are both products that actually, um, you know, then impact on people's finances and where, um, you know, that they have a little choice because uh, for payday, for consumer leases, um, people pay via Centrelink. 
um, by Centrepay. So, um, you know, what these companies do is, oh, you can get this. So we know that uh, they drive into communities with the washing machine in trucks. You can get this washing machine. It only costs, you know, $30 a fortnight. You don't have to pay it straight away. Here's a Centrepay form. All you have to do is sign it. Um, you'll be fine and um, people are uh, then stuck in those contracts for those consumer leases. Mr Boyle, would you like to comment on those matters? ASIC receives a significant amount of reports of misconduct in relation to both consumer lease providers and small amount credit contract providers, um, which are otherwise uh, referred to as payday lenders. And we do see um, some behaviours that are less than ethical, I guess, in that we've uh, heard reports of uh, senior members of communities, elders, for example, that are trusted and respected, being provided with incentives to introduce uh, the company to other members of the community. And when that happens, they're more likely to enter into an agreement because they're being provided with that service by um, someone that they trust. So, yes, we, we do um, get a lot of reports of misconduct and we've had a range of, of outcomes against uh, consumer lease providers that have been um, breaching the laws that we administer. I did just also want to step back to, to car loans um, very briefly because I did talk about um, car loans that are, un, uh, that are unregulated at the moment in terms of people accessing them through book up. But with ASIC has also taken action um, where uh, motor vehicle finance providers have been providing car loans that are regulated to Indigenous consumers. And um, one of those was the Chanik litigation that we ran uh, in Yarrabah, which is a community outside of Cairns. And in, uh, in that matter, we had it raised with us that consumers were being given loans that almost from the, the first time that they had to make a repayment, they were unable to afford the repayments. Um, and people had been uh, asked to provide um, cash deposits of two or $3,000 in order to purchase the motor vehicles. They were then often charged brokerage fees of between $550 and $990 for an introduction to the lender. Uh, and the lender was owned by the same individual that also owned the car yard. Um, and what we seen in that case was that often people would uh, default on the, on the repayments under the loan and then that car would be repossessed from them and sold under the same terms to other people in the community. And those loans were um, being charged at, at an interest rate of 48%, which is the highest allowable, um, the highest allowable interest rate. So we do see co quite predatory um, practices um, in that instance. <coughs> and again, that was the matter I spoke about before, where people did tell us that um, the higher the interest rate, the better, uh, as they understood it in entering them car loans. So um, we, we do see in the regulated space as well some predatory behaviour. And um, what people said to ASIC when they were reporting the misconduct was that the car provider knew that there would be some money coming into the Aboriginal communities around Cairns at that time, and that's why the behaviour began. What was the nature of the money that was coming into the community at that time? Um, Cyclone Yassi had been through uh, not long before, and a lot of people in the community received Cyclone emergency relief payments of two or $3,000 for the damage to their houses. All right. Uh, can we move from consumer lending products to a different form uh, of financial product, uh, which is funeral insurance? Uh, now, Mrs Edwards, could we start um, uh, by having you explain the cultural significance um, of funerals uh, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? Yes, certainly. So. Um Given that um, Aboriginal and Tor Torres Strait Islander people have um, strong kinship values um, and cultural obligation, um, the process around death is actually called sorry business. Um, and sorry business is the journey that begins when a person is dying until they actually pass away. Um, for um, and and it could and it can and it could actually continue after their death as well. So for Torres Strait Islander people. Um, the, the um, laying of the headstone a year after burial is a very important traditional ceremony. Um, sorry business is a very ceremonial practice, particularly in remote communities that are very traditional. Um, it may involve the whole community and we know, and financial counsellors um, have um, reported that at time of sorry business, then there's no actual uh, uh, work or um, programs or activities that can be run in these communities. Um, and sorry business for many of these traditional communities could go for weeks, um, as I explained earlier um, in my statement. 
Um, but, you know, when um, whole communities come together to grieve, that means that more people will need to be fed. Um, and it's usually um, up to the hosting families that would actually have to provide uh, food and shelter for people to um, be able to um, participate um, in these ceremonial practices. Um, <coughs> And what we've, what financial counsellors have found um, in their work with clients, particularly Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander clients, is prioritising of funeral um, payments over everything else is quite high. Um, and so, um, you know, people will stop paying um, um, less for food um, because they actually don't want to, um, you know, not pay for funeral expenses because of the um, ceremonial practice that comes with it. Um, so, yeah, it's actually um, quite a, um, a, a, a cultural practice that happens not just only in traditional communities and remote communities, it certainly happens in urban communities as well, where families do come together to grieve as a whole. And in your view, is there a relationship between the cultural significance of sorry business and the uptake by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people of funeral insurance? Yes, certainly, be because uh, the importance of the actual funeral ceremony. Um, so um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people know that there's a cost um, to you know, <coughs> someone passing away, and they certainly don't want to leave that cost for family. Um, and um, we know that um, um, that the majority of people that have these funeral products um, also have those those contracts to cover their children or their grandchildren. In some cases, for grandmothers, we do know that there are grandmothers that have uh, their grand grandchildren on contract as well. That are, you know, it could be there as soon as they are born. <coughs> The contracts you're referring to there are funeral insurance contracts? Yes, they are, yes. And, um, you know, uh, in the past, these products are, were sold door to door to people, and the way uh, that they were sold um, to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, was really around those kinship obligations and cultural obligations. Um, so, uh, you know, an example of that um, is um, ACBF, so Aboriginal Community Benefit Fund, um, who went door to door selling products um, to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, so those people thought that that um, service was an Aboriginal service, um, so were very trusting and um, wanted to sign up um, because of um, the, the ceremonial practice of funerals. Um, and in some cases, um, people of, um, you know, of um, dark complexion were used to sell that product because it meant it, a relationship was all, was would start immediately because the trust in another, you know, um, whether it's an Aboriginal person or a, a dark-skinned person. Um, and the fact is that, um, you know, the, the conversations with leading um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander services within communities um, around, you know, displaying posters um, of, the, of the service um, then led people to believe that, okay, this is actually an Aboriginal service that I can actually trust and I will, um, you know, um, become a member of that service and pay into that fund. Uh, Mr Boyle, can I ask you to comment on a number of themes from Mrs Edwards' answers to my questions? Uh, firstly, about the cultural significance of sorry business. <coughs> Secondly, about the relationship of that cultural significance to the uptake of funeral insurance. And thirdly, about the practices for the selling of funeral insurance that Mrs Edwards has commented on. Absolutely. So, sorry, business is a very significant um, cultural aspect for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, um, and funerals in general. I think for all people are quite a significant time. Uh, I think both because of the cultural obligation to make sure that sorry business occurs in a culturally appropriate way, and um, and that certain ceremonial business is conducted, that that does um, increase people's reliance on making sure that they have appropriate amounts of finance to cover the cost of of um, funerals as they occur, but also Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have, have generally a much lower life expectancy than other people. And because of our cultural obligations to, to demand share and to share resources, often Aboriginal people have um, an obligation to provide financial support for a larger range of funerals than just their immediate family. And I think because funerals are quite expensive, I think 
the figure that you quoted yesterday was somewhere between four and, and fifteen thousand dollars on average. And people in very remote Indigenous communities, in particular, tend to be on quite <coughs> low incomes. So people know that it's a significant cost, and they're going to be concerned about making sure that they meet that. So that does encourage them to think about ways that. Uh, that they might pay for the funeral. So both the cultural significance and the cost of funerals and the number of funerals that people are obligated to contribute to in, uh, increases people's reliance on, on funeral products. Um, and I apologise. So I'm sorry, by giving you three <laughs> topics to deal with, that was very unfair. The, the third topic that I asked you to consider was the sales practices. Yeah, the sales practices um, we have seen, and, and I think Linda, uh, pointed to the Aboriginal Community Benefit Fund and as an example that uh, company between 2015 and 16 were sending out uh, large posters to Aboriginal people that were members of their fund and the posters used words like awarded or a certificate or achieved and said the amount of money that a person had had um, had reached the benefit amount of so maybe they've reached a $20,000 benefit amount for example but the policies that were being issued at that time were funeral expenses only policies. So where the certificate might have said people are awarded, you've reached $30,000, this certificate is awarded to you for reaching a $30,000 benefit, uh, where that funeral on average cost between seven and $15,000, then $30,000 was really a misrepresentation of the total amount of benefit that people would be able to obtain under the policy. And we receive um, regular reports, both from consumers themselves and from consumer advocates uh, that people seen them posters and, and they seen quite significant amounts of money. They'd never had access to $30,000 before, for example, and that led them to sign up to the posters. Uh, we've also um, had them saying reports that Linda uh, spoke about where people have thought that the Aboriginal Community Benefit Fund in particular was an Aboriginal organisation and that it was set up to, to benefit them and not knowing that it was a private company. Um, we've heard from consumers that people have conflated a, a previous uh, type of fund that used to be run by the New South Wales Local Aboriginal Land Council, for example, which was a contributory funeral fund. Um, and people often uh, don't realise that that's not the same as ACBF from reports that, that we receive. Um, we also had reports that, uh, that ACBF representatives were not always explaining the key features of the products and that many people didn't realise that they were only covered for funeral insurance. Uh, that policy also had um, suicide exclusions previously and we received reports uh, from both consumer advocates and Indigenous consumers themselves where uh, people are quite upset once someone has passed away through suicide. Um, <coughs> the other ways that we do see them kind of policies being sold is over the telephone and uh, certainly we see other um, insurance providers and funeral product providers contacting people over the telephone and signing them up to, to these kind of policies. And over the telephone we've seen in the sale of funeral insurance products, I think I, I mentioned earlier, Clearview Life Assurance Limited, where we've seen gratuitous concurrence play out in leading people to enter them contracts when they did not intend to as well. So the, the marketing um, practices uh, have obviously had an impact on, on encouraging people to enter into those um, contracts. Mrs Edwards, uh, could I ask you about some matters that you refer to in your statement in connection with funeral insurance? <coughs> you refer to situations where individuals that Financial Counselling Australia has dealt with hold multiple funeral insurance policies. Could you explain that? Yes, so what, we, what we've seen is that um, when um, a, a client actually comes in and, and they disclose that they have funeral insurance and under further investigation we see that that funeral insurance has been, um, uh, has been um, supplied to the client even though that the company was aware that um, they also had um, funeral coverage by um, the local um, Aboriginal organisations, particularly under uh, royalty payments. Um, and so, um, you know, the, the second insurance was really, um, you know, not needed for that particular, for those clients because um, they were already covered, but they still sold the product to the, to the clients in regards to that. 
And you refer to issues uh, that clients raise with Financial Counselling Australia about policies not covering all aspects of sorry business. Could you explain that? That's right. So a majority of the, the funeral products, uh, insurance products that are around now don't take into account the journey that sorry business takes. So it's not just really a, about the burial. Um, there's all other things that are involved in that and certainly around family um, and whole communities coming together. Um, and um, when people were signed up to some of these products, they thought that it covered the whole cost of funerals, including wakes, um, and obviously um, it didn't. So um, they were receiving their certificates um, that had, you have $20,000, you know, um, um, as, uh, that you've paid into your um, uh, funeral um, fund um, and but uh, when they and they think that oh, okay if the funeral is only eight thousand dollars then I will actually get twelve thousand dollars refunded to me and it didn't it doesn't work that way uh, now mr. Boyle are you aware of situations in which Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, people have had their funeral insurance policy cancelled for non-payment of premiums Absolutely, yeah. We see that um, not infrequently where people are unable to keep up with their premiums and have uh, policies cancelled as, as a result of that. I'd also like to make comment on, on what Linda just said as well, which is that we do see quite a large number of people that are taking out funeral insurance <coughs> policies where they also have their funeral covered through another means. So. There are a range of land councils that will provide funeral benefit payments to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Still in New South Wales, and as an example, there's up to $1,500 towards funerals that can be provided from the Aboriginal Land Council and a range of other government bodies. Um, we also have areas where uh, funeral and sorry business practices are covered under the native title agreements or under funds that are received from native title agreements. And we have seen uh, people who have purchased funeral insurance policies when the entire cost of their sorry business is already covered through a native title agreement. Um, so we often see people getting into these kind of um, funeral products where they are already covered. Again, and, and there are some difficulties accessing deceased estates under superannuation, but an increasing proportion of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people do have superannuation when they pass away. And under superannuation, often there is a death benefit or other kinds of insurance that can assist in paying for these products. So we see people entering into products that, where, the, where their funerals are already covered. Um, we see people, uh, as you've just asked, having their products cancelled as a result of not making payments. But also, uh, within the first five years of owning a funeral insurance product across the board, not just for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but ASIC's um, research report uh, found that 55% of all funeral insurance policies are cancelled in the first five years of the policies um, having been opened. And 65% of those policies are cancelled by the consumer directly, as opposed to being cancelled as a result of missed payment of fees. And to me, I guess that indicates that potentially the consumer either didn't particularly want to enter into that contract to begin with, or didn't have the terms of the contract explained to them adequately. And so they've made a decision within that first 12 month period to cancel the policies. And we also see um, that uh, funeral insurance policies, people often pay a significant amount more in insurance premiums or, or, or for the policies they're entering into than the benefit that they'll ever obtain under the policy. And just as an example of that, uh, in our 2014 report, research report into funeral insurance in Australia, we found that across the board for all Australians that less than 5% of funeral insurance products have been held for more than eight years. So anyone who has had a funeral insurance product for greater than eight years, 95% of them people have paid more than any benefit they'll ever get out. Uh, now, can I ask you, Mrs Edwards, uh, how Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people tend to pay the uh, uh, payments under their funeral insurance policies is it, <coughs> is it done by is it done by direct debit uh, how do the payments occur um, there are a couple of ways now um, initially um, with ACBF it was via center pay um, so the majority nowadays um, for funeral insurance is paid by direct debit um, and that's usually set up by the company that's selling the product 
um, and um, uh, so you know relying on um, on cultural obligation um, and people's responsibility to community and family, um, you know, people are signing up to these products and um, and not really um, sort of understanding what the products are about. Um, I have a, a I know, I'm well aware of a of a case um, in our community where uh, a mother um, has signed um, onto funeral products for herself and her five children for forty four dollars a fortnight. Um, and her main source of income is um, New Start on Centrelink, um, and so we, you know, we can see that the importance of people, um, you know, doing this. So um, and not and then not un actually understanding the direct debit system, then actually puts them at risk of not paying um, for their funeral insurance, and then at risk of actually losing that contract. In your experience, are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in remote communities? <coughs> aware of how to cancel a direct debit? Um, not, they, they do know that they can, they can be cancelled. The challenge around that is with, um, with many financial services is that um, they tell Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that they cannot cancel their direct debits even though it's their account and their money. They suggest to them that they have to actually go back to the creditor and the, it's at the creditor's responsibility to cancel the direct debit when we know um, under the code that a um, that that they can actually cancel their own direct debit, um, and this is the problem with um, um, staff in banking services at the coalface of actually not knowing what the rules are around direct debits. Can I ask you to look at another page of the revised code of <coughs> banking practice, uh, the draft RCD quadruple nine zero zero three seven zero five one seven. that the obligations that are proposed under the revised <coughs> code include in uh, paragraph 134 an obligation upon request to give a list of direct debits and recurring payments on a person's account for up to the previous 13 months? Yes. And you see in paragraph 135 the obligation uh, to promptly process a request to cancel direct debits? Yes. Uh, and the obligation in paragraph 136 to promptly assist if a request is made to investigate an unauthorised direct debit? Yes. And information that needs to be provided in connection with any cancellation or complaint uh, referred to in paragraph 137? Yes. In <coughs> your experience, are banks complying with the sorts of obligations that we see here? Um, not systemically, no. So what we're seeing is that um, banks are refusing people to cancel direct debits. Um, and when a direct debit does go out, it's cancelled. When it is cancelled, um, it takes a very long time then to retrieve the money that's been taken. Um, and so financial counsellors are dealing with this on a daily basis, I would imagine. Mr Boyle, can I ask you to comment firstly on this issue in relation to cancellations of direct debits? Cancellations of direct debits, we, we have heard where people have had difficulties cancelling direct debits. Um, I haven't come across it as, as much of a significant issue as, as Linda has, but Linda hears more directly about that issue um, than I do. But in terms of uh, direct debits being listed on, on people's bank statements, particularly in um, communities where English is not a fir first language and where uh, a majority of the community might not speak uh, or speak very functional English or be able to read in English, then what we often find is that people don't realise that they have got direct debits set up, that there might have been a direct debit that's been recurring for quite a number of years and, and um, we hear reports that, that people just don't realise and, and when it's raised with them, do you realise that you're paying for this consumer lease, for example, under a direct debit um, and people are, no, I've had that lounge for five years and under the terms of that, of the contract, it rolls over. Um, if the person doesn't cancel the consumer lease or the direct debit at the end of the contract, it just starts a new contract. So I think it's certainly a good obligation um, that banks will be happy to provide a list of direct debits and recurring payments for the previous 13 months. 
uh, the obligation at the moment is really has the onus on a consumer to request that information and potentially it would be good to reverse that onus and to have uh, banks provide a, a general list of, of them recurring payments to people proactively rather than the onus being on the consumer to request a copy of that statement. Um, and certainly if that was a separate document as opposed to being somewhere contained at the back of a bank statement, for people with lower levels of literacy <coughs> that might uh, might make them more aware of what direct debits that they are paying for through their account if it comes in a separate communication. And we heard Mrs Edwards refer before in answering my question about methods of payment for funeral insurance. Mrs Edwards referred to in the past uh, funeral insurance payments sometimes being made via centre pay. Is that something that you've seen as well? Absolutely. I think that it would be fair to say that a majority of the funeral insurance contracts that we've um, had raised with us were being paid by through centre pay prior to uh, funeral insurance being removed uh, as a as a, an item that could be paid for using centre pay, which is the direct the bill paying service op operated by the Department of Human Services. And I'll just let you know how that works. Um, it, it was designed as being a, a bill paying mechanism to assist uh, Indigenous people and other low income earners, the so Centrelink recipients, to make sure that they were able to pay for essential items like rent and electricity. And that bill paying mechanism uh, takes money out of people's uh, welfare, uh, welfare income and pays that to to their uh, to their landlord for example it'll pay their rent before the remainder of their Centrelink income comes to their bank account so it's a way of ensuring that people can manage their budgets but um, we did see a lot of people prior to funeral insurance being removed from the centre pay system um, that were paying for their funeral insurance through centre pay and uh, even uh, the information that's given about centre pay deductions has recently improved but Prior to that, um, several years ago, when we first started receiving reports of people paying for funeral insurance through centre pay, uh, centre pay deductions were not itemised on people's Centrelink income statements. It used to just say centre pay $300, for example, and that might have covered your rent, your electricity, and two consumer leases and a funeral insurance product. So once people started to get itemised listings of the payments <laughs> they were making um, through their centre pay deductions, uh, we've seen a lot of people cancelling contracts that they had forgotten that they were paying for through, through that mechanism. And, and I believe that direct debit is now the most common way that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people do pay for funeral insurance. Can I turn now uh, to ask you uh, questions about one other form of financial product, which is superannuation? Both of you have made some references already in the course of your evidence to difficulties encountered by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in dealing with superannuation funds. So could I ask each of you to address in turn what you see as the major issues for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in dealing with uh, their superannuation entitlements? Firstly, can I say that um, issues around uh, superannuation take up an, an enormous amount of time for financial counsellors and capability workers in assisting um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in remote and regional co communities. Um, and, um, we'll, and we know that this, the, the, the challenges and barriers around that is um, obviously uh, low numeracy and literacy levels. So many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in these communities um, do not understand the superannuation, how superannuation <coughs> works, um, and really um, don't have the confidence to interact um, with the system um, without assistance. Um, we know that there are lots of issues around proving identity. Um, so uh, in relation to um, proving who they are and um, obviously um, for um, intestate um, accounts, um, we know that um, through that, the kinship um, relationships within Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people play a huge role um, and relate to the beneficiaries under a policy. Um, and obviously, um, and Nathan um, alluded to this earlier, is the life expectancy for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people is significantly lower than other Australians. Um, and um, we know that many Aboriginal um, and Torres Strait Islander people in regional and remote communities do die intestate. Um, 
So, you know, superannuation is, is very broad um, and some of the work uh, that financial counsellors are doing um, is basically trying to find um, superannuation in the first place. This can be, um, you know, quite a challenge if people can't remember where they worked or where they were, um, um, not sure what their tax file number is. And um, so going through all the paperwork with that, um, explaining the words that are in, um, you know that are that are associated with claiming superannuation, or um, is is always a challenge because of English um, being a second or third language. Um, um, so the major problems that most of the financial counsellors are seeing is, is the delay um, that it takes to be able to um, make a decision um, about any type of um, uh, income um, or um, payments that people can actually apply for. Um, financial counsellors are saying that not all forms are sent out at the same time. So you fill in one form, you send that away, or you have to fill in this form. So then that comes. We know that in a um, majority of superannuation funds, all the forms are all different and there's different ways of claiming, um, the different wording. Um, so it's, it's quite a, a challenge. And um, as one of the ways that I can sort of explain superannuation is that um, it's like you're trying to swim upstream of a river that's really, really um, heavy and hard. Um, trying to um, negotiate the system of superannuation for Aboriginal people is like that. And after a while, you just get, become too tired. You're just tired from swimming upstream, and so you just give up. Um, and by giving up, you're losing out on things that you could actually um, benefit your life. For example, insurance, if you actually have a disability or um, you know, you, you're um, applicable for a TPD, for example. So um, you know, the superannuation system is quite a, system, quite a really uh, um, system that uh, is really hard to navigate. Mr Boyle. Yes, um, access to superannuation for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people is a particular passion of mine and um, the same kind of uh, issues in relation to access to that service exist as for the whole range of other financial service services. So identification issues that I spoke about earlier exist, but even where someone does have a full set of identity documents, then having them copied, having access to a photocopier that will copy them to a standard that will be accepted by financial service providers can be quite difficult. Uh, some superannuation companies will have a requirement that they're certified by a certain person and having access to someone to appropriately certify the documents in very remote communities uh, can be very uh, difficult. And as Linda just said, all superannuation funds have different requirements about what kinds of identification documents that they'll accept and what the certification process is. So that can be um, quite difficult for people. We see inside of superannuation um, um, an underutilisation of some of the insurance that is captured in, in superannuation products, such as TPD insurance. It's not unusual for me to hear reports of uh, financial counsellors meeting with Indigenous people and finding out that they are totally and permanently disabled and have a policy that they can make a claim for under their superannuation. Um, and unfortunately, in some of those instances, we've heard that the time period to make a claim under the TPD policy has expired because people weren't made um, aware that it existed. Uh, for um, deceased estates in particular, <coughs> it is quite difficult at the moment. Um, I referred before to the range of work type activities that are unpaid that are undertaken by people, uh, Indigenous people in particular, living in uh, remote communities. So. Often when a family member passes away, the family aren't aware of whether or not the person will have superannuation. They will think, yes, my relative worked, but they won't know whether or not that was work that did um, provide a superannuation benefit for the person. <coughs> so the way that people need to uh, locate what superannuation might have existed for the deceased family member is often by contacting the Australian Taxation Office because superannuation funds are required to report to the ATO when they hold super in a member's name. Um, and at the moment, it's quite a difficult process for someone because in order for the ATO to provide that personal information about what superannuation funds were reporting to you in the deceased relative's name, they require people to get, to either have a will that shows that they're the appropriate person to talk to or to seek letters of administration for the estate that can be a costly process and it can be a minimum of a couple of thousand dollars, which makes it um, yeah, difficult for people to even find out whether or not that superannuation exists. 
And then once it does exist, as I said before, our kinship structures don't always align uh, to, the, to the people who are allowed to receive the benefits from superannuation from deceased estates. Um, regularly, we will hear of people that are trying to access either their own superannuation or that of a deceased person and that they will give up. They will just think that it's too hard. And uh, that is really disappointing for me because um, I think that there is a, a general assumption in the broader population that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people don't always have superannuation, but there are people in remote communities. I was in the Unlawp in Jadayunk and Jada Lounge just four weeks ago, and we came across people who had very significant superannuation balances, more than $100,000, and that is their money, and they should be able to access that the same as everyone else. They've worked, they've made contributions to superannuation, and unfortunately at the moment, uh, there isn't enough assistance being provided to people to make sure that they do get the benefit of that superannuation. Mr Boyle, could you explain some of the work that you've been involved with to try and address some of the issues that you've just explained? Yes, absolutely. Um, and I certainly want to uh, point out that there's a range of other people and organisations that have been involved as well. Um, but I think I ra raised previously when I uh, was in Lockhart River um, on different business back in, I think it was around 2012 that I was <coughs> up there, uh, we came across a significant number of people that did have superannuation uh, that had reached a condition of release that were unable to access that at the time. Most of those members were from a superannuation fund called Q Super. And so we, uh, we came back and spoke um, at ASIC about how we might be able to help people to access their superannuation. And we decided to take an executive from Q Super, uh, the head of technical operations at the time, Lynn Melser, to Lockhart River to ask her to um, try and assist Aboriginal people to access their own fund. Um, and I think Lynn will not mind me saying that when she was first invited, she, her response was that, we treat all of our members equally. We certainly treat Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people equally. Don't worry, we're not treating people any differently. Um, but once she did come to the community, she, at the end of the first day, said, this is outrageous. We are treating people equally, but that's not meaning they're equally able to access our services. And they're our members, and we have an obligation to provide them with funds. Um, as a result of that and other work, consumer advocates for many years have been um, raising concerns with superannuation access um, that the industry, to their great credit, decided to um, do some work around this and they formed an industry Indigenous superannuation working group, uh, which has now held two annual conferences to have a look at Indigenous access and engagement issues around superannuation um, and to in increase identification, uh, in in increase the ability for people to identify themselves, sorry, when they don't meet the standard 100 points of identification. ASIC continues to work with the superannuation industry by trying to take senior representatives from funds out to Aboriginal communities so that they can really experience how them policies are, are, are affecting people on the ground and whether or not the policies that are in place at a head office level um, are appropriate for consumers on the ground. And we've seen a range of funds make um, quite significant changes to their policies and procedures so, for example, again, I'll use the example of Q Super, but they have identified uh, postcodes in their region that have a significant Indigenous population, and they have then uh, worked with the Australian Taxation Office to find superannuation that has been transferred to the Australian Taxation Office's lost super, and then they've proactively, as a fund, worked with community organisations in their postcodes to reunite people with their superannuation. Lost super is another very significant form, and I think in, in the Kimberleys, which is another remote area of Australia, there's currently $19.2 million of lost superannuation in that area, uh, a significant proportion of that, which would be for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, and whilst there is not data to show this, we would think that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people become lost members uh, at a higher rate than other people. <coughs> And that's because someone becomes a lost member when their fund has tried to communicate with them twice and the letter, for example, has been returned to sender. Because of the inefficient postal services in remote communities, a lot of people are uh, having them communications returned to sender and then as a result of that, having superannuation um, transferred to the HL as lost super. Mrs Edwards, would you like to comment further on any of the superannuation related issues that you see in light of Mr Boyle's answer? 
Yep, certainly, um, as financial counsellors that are on the ground and assisting people in um, reconnecting with their superannuation and then obviously making, assisting them making claims, uh, we do have some um, uh, examples of um, where it's just been, um, you know, really difficult for financial counsellors um, to work with superannu superannuation funds. So, um, you know, uh, some financial counsellors say it can take months for a fund to make a decision about an income protection or a TPD claim um, or a death benefit. Um, for example, one financial counsellor reported that it took 18 months for a uh, TPD claim to be approved for a client who had end-stage renal fa failure and permanent paralysis on one side as a result of a stroke. Um, another reported it also took 18 months of TPD claim for a client who had emphysema and a back injury. Um, we know that there's owner's requests for information, a fund requesting a copy of a resume for an Aboriginal client. Um, it would be highly unusual for an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person um, in a regional and a remote community to have a resume. Um, you know, we hear stories of an old man living in a remote community. A fund requested his entire work history since leaving school, including his trainings and qualifications. Um, requesting copies of pay slips for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, people that may not have them, um, so we, because they may not be clear about the employer who um, employed them or the date that they last work. So one older man uh, making a claim for a TPD payment was forced to chase uh, an employment termination letter from an, an employer he had worked for six years previously. Um, after the fund refused to uh, accept his claim um, because he couldn't nominate the exact day he last worked there. Um, so there's lots of, um, you know, identification is another um, issue. Um, one financial counsellor had spoken to uh, the superannuation fund and had pointed them to um, to impose the um, Austrac identification uh, requirements. Um, and the um, the fund told the financial counsellor who was helping um, the um, Aboriginal man that they'd never heard of the Austrac guidance um, and the statement <coughs> by referee. Um, and he could not use the form to <laughs> prove his identity. Um, later, in the the, later in the same claim, um, the trustees for the fund refused to pay out the money unless the old man, uh, the fellow, uh, actually provided um, his form of identification. Um, you know, funds losing paperwork, we're, we're hearing that all the time. Um, you know, um, and the fact is that most of the superannuation funds are not very proactive when it comes to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, super accounts. Um, we know that um, if um, super, if those funds um, have very little um, uh, money in them, um, that the possibility of losing the insurance that's attached to that superannuation fund is uh, very likely for um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So, you know. Um, uh, and it, this is one of the issues where superannuation funds also don't ask for people to identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. Um, you know, if that was a if that was a, a requirement for the fund, they would actually be able to see that um, that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander <coughs> people um, may, who may not be working but have a super fund would certainly be able to um, access their insurance. So um, we have a case where um, a client um, was ten dollars away um, from having his superannuation account closed even though he had $120,000 in insurance in that actual fund. Um, so the financial counsellor was able to capture that um, for that particular person um, who was who was actually um, uh, trying to apply for a TPD um, because he uh, was sick um, and his empl uh, employer had actually told him that um, you know he needed to go and see a, a CDP um, employer because he was too sick to work. Um, so, uh, yeah, and not all funds have um, the same um, forms for early release or the same processes for early release of super. Um, and, um, you know, for financial counsellors, um, this means a lot more work in, in being able to assist people that need to access that through either financial hardship or medical reasons. Could I also comment as well on that early release uh, through hardship? Um, as Linda's pointed out, the life expectancy of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people is much lower. ASIC hasn't formally considered um, the position on, on uh, life expectancy and the preservation age of superannuation, but my personal perspective is that um, because of the inherent design of the superannuation system, the greatest growth in member balances happens in the last 10 years of having that account because of the compound interest. So I think it would be disadvantageous to reduce the preservation age, and that I want to make clear is not a formal 
ASIC position, but um, where I see there being greater benefit is around the early release and perhaps having average nullity or indigeneity as a factor that could be considered um, in determining whether or not superannuation should be released early for, uh, uh, for hardship purposes or um, for uh, total and permanent disability as an example. Uh, Linda just mentioned renal failure and we do have significant amounts of kidney disease and of, of, of um, type 2 diabetes in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. And at the moment it's very difficult for people to certify their illness to the satisfaction of their superannuation fund. Often funds will require people to have two independent medical experts. Uh, many communities in remote areas are only serviced by uh, the flying doctor service, for example. And so it's almost impossible for a, a very ill person to get two medical professionals to certify uh, that. And also, um, at the stage where someone is considered to have a terminal illness that would allow them to receive their Centrelink payments, that's often once they are at the very end stage of receiving dialysis treatments and they often don't receive the payment at a time when they can utilise it. So I think that some more thinking could be done around um, the definition of total and permanent disability and that where people are on, uh, do have significant renal issues or, or significantly advanced type 2 diabetes that potentially Aboriginality could be used given the lower life expectancy as a factor that made it more likely for a superannuation fund to provide early access. Um, however, obviously with all things it's quite complex and I would encourage the superannuation industry to have a conversation with uh, members that they are releasing or, or to government departments involved in the hardship process to make sure they really understand the circumstance of the Indigenous consumer that is requesting access for hardship. One concern for me has been the conversations in industry at the moment about potentially bringing in early access for, as a result of domestic violence and in my experience uh, in remote Indigenous communities in particular, where people are in domestic violence relationships, the perpetrator can try and force people to try and access their payments early uh, to get that off them. So if uh, it became known that you can access your situation <coughs> early as a result of domestic violence, my concern is that that might exacerbate people's personal situations. So uh, whilst I think that it should be made easier for people to access their superannuation, early, I think that uh, funds need to keep in mind the, the circumstances that their members might be living in and make sure that they uh, take due diligence before providing the payment to make sure it is going to benefit their member. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to say is that superannuation for a lot of, very, for a lot of remote Indigenous people, a, a lot of people were subject to indentured labour policies under previous government um, policies. and. That meant that significant proportions of their income were placed in government trust accounts. That's referred colloquially to as stolen wages. And when we're talking to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people about superannuation, they kind of tend to contextualise that as being stolen wages. Um, it's quite difficult sometimes for people who have had their, their wages taken from them to learn about a bank account that they can only access once they are, they are old and, and that they hear many of their family members passing away before they've got the benefit from. So, um, the education around what superannuation is and, and how it can benefit people. Uh, we try and do as much as we can at ASIC um, to do that. We've got a couple of animations that raise awareness of that. Uh, we go out, I was out four weeks ago and did a live interpreted session for Pit and Judder language speakers about what superannuation is. Um, but that is another reason that people will give up at, a, at what might seem like a relatively small hurdle. So you might think if someone has $35,000 in superannuation and they've been told, oh, you didn't meet the identification requirements, why wouldn't they try again? But for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, they think often, and it's reported to us, why would I try again? That money's been stolen, it's gone. They're not going to let me access. So people will stop trying to um, access that at the first service. And one really proactive thing that has been happening in this space, uh, it's the last thing I think I'll, I'll mention, is that... Um, First Nations Foundation of Financial Literacy charity that works specifically with Aboriginal people um, has partnered with, uh, with some of the superannuation industry bodies and has been funded by them to run a big super day out, which um, is a bit of a road show that goes and assists to provide that direct access to superannuation to Indigenous consumers. So um, whilst there are difficulties, there are some beneficial things and, and I really do want to point out that the superannuation industry um, as, a, as a subset of the financial services sector really has been making efforts to, to improve Indigenous people's access.
And if I could just make some points, just uh, Nathan just mentioned First Nations Foundation um, uh, in regards to the big super day out, and um, you know, we and uh, within our uh, financial counselling Australia's partnership with First Nations people, there are some considerable points that they've raised um, in regards to superannuation. Um, and if if I may, if if I could just go through a couple of those points, um, so. This, they say that for most Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, super will be their largest asset and only savings. Um, they, if you are an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person and you live remotely, you have a, a, about a 2% chance of navigating the super system. Um, and Australians, including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, pay service through super um, to the tune of um, $31 billion per year, but are not receiving um, services that they actually need. And in 2018, First Nation Foundation has found that no one can actually answer the question, will Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have enough super for retirement because of the identity issue? And I think they're really important points for us to consider. Okay. Now, in, in concluding, uh, both of you have referred to a number of changes that you think could be made to improve the engagement of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in regional and remote communities with financial services entities. But can I ask each of you, starting with you, Mrs Edwards, um, what, what is the single most important change that you think should be made? Um, you know, there's a, a lot of things that I'd like to be able to say. Um, uh, it's certainly around, you know, what would be really beneficial in this space. Uh, but if I had to pick a couple of things, if that's okay. Have two, Mr. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would say that to ensure that um, any codes and legislation that um, that um, uh, is for financial services um, is to make a requirement for those services to be really proactive in working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, and particularly for, for that knowledge of those requirements to, to come to be able to be um, known from the executive right to the coalface um, so that everyone is and there's training and um, information around that so that um, you know that um, you know the coalface people are working appropriately um, with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and I suppose for Financial Counselling Australia considering that um, you know we are regularly have clients referred to us from financial services um, and also from um, energy companies um, that government consider a levy um, on those services to be able to assist Financial Counselling Australia and financial counsellors to do their job on the ground. Boyle, what about you? What are the, the things that you think would make the most difference uh, to deal with all of the issues that you've identified today? Yes, and whilst it's not a bank specific thing, I would like to second Linda's comment that um, greater funding for financial counsellors from the industry would be um, a real benefit because we do see that a significant proportion of Indigenous people in remote and regional communities are unable to navigate financial services without assistance. Uh, but there are a range of policies like the Austrack Alternative Guidance and, and some other policies across the financial services sector that, uh, that are well known by the industry and that there is a commitment to at that head office level. I think the biggest change um, that would really benefit things for Indigenous consumers is if there was a, a concerted effort to make sure that all, all of the, the members of that service right down to the coalface to the people who are on the telephone or who are dealing face to face with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are aware of the policies that have been agreed to by the industry. And um, what I would really love to see is more executives from banks and more policy makers from banks and from financial services institutions who are making these policies to go out to Aboriginal communities and to see how the policies are actually working on the ground. Because we've seen with Lynn Melser and we've seen with a range of other executives that have visited communities with me that they might think that they have great policies and they may very well have very good policies, but it is only once they get out onto the ground and they're helping their own customers or their own members to access their own services where they realise the difficulties in their policies. And so the more policy makers and executives that go out and see how their institution is working on the ground in communities, I think that that's when we see the greatest change and the greatest increase in financial inclusion. So I think, yeah, I would really like to see more policy makers go out and see how their policies are working. Thank you for your assistance. I have no further questions, Commissioner. Thank you, Ms. Orr. Mr. McIntyre, is there anything you seek to raise? No, I think they've covered the issues very thoroughly. Is there any other party having 
leave to appear, seek to ask these witnesses any questions? No? Very well. Thank you very much for the help you've given. Uh, I'm very grateful to you. And uh, you may step down and you are excused. Thank you. Commissioner, our first case study involves ACBF, the Australian Community Benefit Fund, and our first witness will be Tracy Walsh, a consumer. I'm in the Commissioner's hands about whether you would like us to start with um, Ms Walsh now or convene for an hour break and reconvene at an earlier point this afternoon. If, if I take five minutes and we do a quarter of an hour with Ms Walsh and uh, see how far we get, and, yes. uh, is that all right? Yes, it is. Thank you, Commissioner. Right. I'll come back at quarter two. <laughs>